Okay, I started recording. Thank you. Right. Excellent. So it is six o'clock on Monday, the 13th of September. We are calling to order uh, this month's meeting of the Transportation Advisory Board. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we are being recorded. And before we get started, we're going to have Jenny Godwin walk us through the usual uh, expectations and uh, protocol for having an online meeting. Um, Jenny, why don't you go ahead and take over? Great. Thanks, Tila. Thanks, everyone, Thanks. for joining TAB tonight. Um, many of you may have seen these slides before, but just a reminder that we're here to strike a balance between meaningful and transparent engagement and online security. So we have a number of rules that are in place. Um, first, of course, this meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. So any activities that disrupt that purpose or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. That will be three minutes for the public comment period. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using their real name. Any person that's believed to be using a pseudonym um, will not be permitted to speak. Uh, no video is permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers. All others will participate by voice only. Um, myself, um, the person presiding at the meeting, will enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. Our chat function is enabled tonight, and we ask that you use that to communicate with the host, host myself, um, for technical and online platform-related questions only. So we ask that that's the only purpose you use the chat for. And also, the, only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screens during the meeting. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda this evening, including um, two public hearing items. So I'm gonna do our best to keep us on track and on target. Uh, we will turn right now to the approval of the minutes from our last TAB meeting. The, um, it says 9-8-2021 on the agenda, but it is the um, August 8th um, minutes. And uh, I have zero changes or corrections. Does anybody else have any changes or corrections to the minutes from last meeting? Tab, I'm looking at you, I got some head shakes. Everybody was here. Lovely. I will entertain a motion to approve said minutes. I think that was Alex. Second. Moving to approve and Mark McIntyre second. All in favor? Aye. Excellent, the minutes are approved. Thank you, Meredith. Um, we also uh, were distributed the uh, minutes from our joint meeting with planning board on uh, July 15th. Um, I did not review them in detail. I did note, um, I forgot on what, which page, but at one point, Alex Weinheimer said back of curb and it got transcribed as backup curve. Uh, and other than that, and the uh, misspelling of my name throughout, uh, and misspelling of transportation in the first line. And I know Meredith, that was not you <laughs> on either count. Uh, other than that, I have no further corrections. Mark has some corrections. Well, I, it's super minor, but if we're correcting Alex's back of curve, uh, I, I said fleshing out and it came out as flushing out. So it, it is, there is a distinction there, so. <laughs> and you are more articulate than that. So yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it just it made it, it I think Alex's comments didn't would not have made sense otherwise. Um, and it was, you know, it's a, a minor, minor thing, but to capture sort of the essence of what he has been stating in several different contexts, I wanted to make that correction. Otherwise, are there any further corrections to the minutes from the July 15 planning joint meeting with tab and planning board? Great. I'm trying to not take the misspelling of my name too personally, despite this being my fifth year on the board. Um, but I will note that um, you know people with weird names and people from other cultures, this is this is a kind of microaggression that they put up with a lot. Um, and uh, we should, as a as a staff and as a city, be trying hard to to avoid easy mistakes like that because they can be misinterpreted. So uh, I will entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Thank you, Hutch. I'll second. Um, 
All in favor of approving the minutes as amended verbally just now. Lovely, abstain. Ryan, yes. I'll abstain, I wasn't, I didn't attend. Oh, you were not at the meeting, that's right, thank you. They spelled your name right though. <laughs> the minutes are approved, thanks very much. But had right. he been there, they wouldn't have pronounced it correctly. That's right, yeah. <laughs> We'll get to that matters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to move quickly on then to public comment. Um, as I mentioned, we do have two public hearing items. And so if you are a member of the public here wishing to speak on items four or five of the agenda, that is the um, East Arapaho multi-use pass um, SEEP or the uh, NSMP projects, I would request that you hold on to those those thoughts, um, we will be turning as quickly as we can to the public hearing on those two items. But if you are a member of the public who wishes to speak to Taver staff uh, about other items, not, not those two, uh, this would be your chance to shine. Uh, typically we give three minutes. Um, there's a lot of people on tonight. So if you don't need all three minutes, I encourage you to not take them, but I see no reason to depart from the three minute um, public comment period, assuming we don't start running too far behind. So if you are interested in engaging and participating in public comment, please try to raise your hand using the raise hand function. And uh, to the question who came in, Mr. Gade, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but yes, um, hang on, we saw your letter. Uh, hang on until we open up the public hearing for uh, the NSMP projects. And that'll be the time for you to, to weigh in on that subject. Does anyone else wish to participate? I see Lynn Siegel's hand up. And no others at the moment. So let's go ahead and get started with Lynn. Okay, I'm gonna do my fancy switcheroo for Thank time. you. Mm -hmm. All right, Lynn, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Let's see, are you able to speak now? Yeah, Great. with all due respect to Jenny, if I hear that riot act described again, I'm tempted to not speak at all. I am so insulted, so insulted that you don't want to see my face. And don't blame it on the council. Don't blame it on the city manager. Blame it on yourselves. How dare you refuse to see my face? I'm seeing yours. Don't insult me. Don't insult me with all these rules that we don't have in a regular city council meeting. They don't read the riot act ahead. I know Jenny's just doing her job, but this is an insult to the public. It's astounding. It's shameful. Think about that. Now, as to my actual substance of my comment, I'm not a believer in Einstein's quote, the definition of insanity. So I'm gonna say it again and again and again and again until I hear something changing. You need to quantify the traffic and transportation infrastructure needed for each human being brought into this community with a development slot, you know, like another affordable housing or unaffordable housing. Every single person in this community needs a transportation impact per capita quantification. Do you understand? I know you can't, this is not back and forth. You better understand because I'm tired of hearing Alex having to go around and be really efficient and make things, you know, make do with inadequate funds, with unfunded liabilities. That's not okay in this community. It's just not okay. Once that quantification happens, the developer shall pay. The developer shall pay. You know what we had at planning board and you joined with planning board, you also need to join with environmental advisory board. And I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, lemonade, I'm lemons, but this is the practical reality of the situation. You need to get with EAB and figure out what's right for this community. 
and it needs to qu be quantified per capita. Simple, easy. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I think David Adamson was having trouble finding uh, the raise hand function. Uh, if anyone else is in the same boat, feel free to type so in the chat and we'll, we'll get around to you. Yeah, definitely, David. I'm gonna restart my time, there we go, and we'll unmute you. Okay, David, see if you can unmute now. All right, thank you so much, members of TAB and beautiful public. Um, I apologize for not quite understanding, but I'd, I'd like to address uh, uh, issue number seven and the DCS um, reform. And I sent a little email about this, but this concerns our continuing effort to create a, a VUNERF on North Street, especially between 6th and 9th, and also connected in with a similar alt modes, uh, bike ped improvements related to Alpine Balsam. And um, we want our, our, our comment is we'd like to make sure there's sufficient flexibility in the DCS going forward to pioneer a street reinvention of Unearf on at least that section of North Street, but also further, as I said, connecting to Alpine Balsam. So I, I have sent an email. We've been doing <clears throat> this for several years. We met with um, Kathleen Brackney when she was there back in 2019 and Amy or Liv, Liv Lewin has helped us with this. So any, uh, it, um, that's our main request. How can we work with you to ensure there's that kind of flexibility in the DCS to, to um, innovate, not have curbs, for example, create a, a real um, um, more pedestrian and bike oriented Sec, uh, section at least on that block, perhaps further on North Street. And we always want to create this bio corridor going north in the alleys to Sanitas. So um, obviously yeah. there's, there's a lot there, but love your feedback, however appropriate via email, but that's, but that's our request. Um, help with the DCS, how can we, and I see the discussion about public engagement there. Um, but we'd love your guidance. Thank you so much for your service and uh, all your beautiful work. Do you look? Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> two things. I just wanted to respond to David very quickly and say, David, I appreciate you sending your uh, drawing as a JPEG. It's a very, very, very small JPEG. And um, uh, if you could send one that was larger, that would be great. Uh, I also wanted to uh, just reply to Lynn um, and just say that Lynn, you know, I appreciate your emails and your comments at our meetings. And I want you to know that um, when you say, you know, don't blame it on this person or that person or council or whatever, you know, we operate and we've had discussions about operating within the rules that the city of Boulder lays down for us. And, um, you know what, I've advocated for, uh, with Sarah Huntley and others, to have video on for uh, commentators when they speak. And I've advocated for, and, and it was implemented that the giant clock was taken down and now it's, uh, it's Jenny's window when, uh, when we have speakers because I find the giant clock intimidating. So anyway, um, I would appreciate it if, uh, you could acknowledge that we are a citizen advisory board, a volunteer citizen advisory board. And in fact, we do advocate for equitable access and we encourage public comment. And yeah, I, I, I think that when you're speaking, you should, we, uh, we should see you just as you see us. So anyway, that's the end of my comment and we can carry on, but I wanted to acknowledge both of those, uh, items. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, you know, members of the public can't see what you've been doing behind the scenes to try to make these meetings and to record the video, for instance, which was a problem earlier. 
Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that Ryan Shuhart has definitely reached out and been um, communicating more uh, actively with the Environmental Advisory Board, as Lynn had suggested. So there are things that we are doing that you can't necessarily see as part of this public facing meeting, but please trust us to, you know, that, that we are trying and we are hearing your comments. And, and fundamentally, I think you have some very good points. So we're working on it, but we are still part of the system. So <laughs> I don't see any other hands raised. Jenny, do you? Don't either, okay, so I will close out the uh, the public comment portion just in the interest of swiftly moving us along to our first public hearing item. This will be on the Arapaho uh, multi-use path. Um, this is a portion of the project where um, the environmental assessment um, portion of the project has to come before TAB um, for a recommendation before going to city council. Uh, it's just one of the regular steps that we have to go through. And typically for a public hearing item, the way that it happens is um, we hear staff's brief um, sort of recitation of what the project background and, and what things look like going forward uh, and have a chance to ask sort of technical questions or clarifying questions. And after that portion, then we will open it up to members of the public who wish to speak on this particular um, project. Um, and then we will close that public hearing and then we will move to board deliberations. Fundamentally, we'll do, do we approve of, um, of the, um, the report and the SEEP and the staff's recommendation or do we think that there needs to be changes to make? make? So that's where we're going to begin. I think Jane Sanson is supposed to be in charge of this item. Is that right? It's me, Taylor. Oh, hi, it's Hello. Ryan Knowles. Yeah. I'm just going by what's in the uh, agenda. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's me. No so, problem. Okay, well, I think we're ready for you then, Ryan. Thanks. Cool. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Knowles. I'm a senior transportation planner here at the City of Boulder Transportation and Mobility Department. And this evening, just going to briefly uh, review the East Arapaho Multi-Use Path and Transit Stops Project, which, as Tila mentioned, went through a community environmental assessment process. So we'll cover uh, just a brief background on the project and then the proposed design and community engagement. Uh, go into a little bit of detail about the SEEP process and then we will discuss next steps. Uh, following the next steps, uh, there'll be a question and answer period for the board uh, follow, followed by a public hearing and then board discussion before they consider a recommendation. So uh, just a little bit of background on this project. So uh, this project is what we've been saying is the first step toward the East Arapaho Transportation Plan. And what we mean by that is that we are looking to establish a continuous multi-use path system on Arapaho Avenue between 38th Street and Marine Street, uh, which is just west of Foothills Parkway and uh, the South Boulder Creek, so near Cherry Vale Road and Old Tail Road. Uh, east of 55th Street. And so the East Arapaho Transportation Plan is a multimodal vision for the State Highway 7 corridor. And uh, again, it has many components, one of which is a multi-use path system. And so what we're trying to do with this project is establish that system. Uh, we have a limited budget of $1.9 million, which includes federal and local funding. Um, and so really we're focused on filling in the missing pieces of that system and then uh, really creating a better buffer between the multi-use path and the uh, travel lanes on Arapaho Avenue. So you can see here those missing links that I just mentioned, um, and then the transit stops we are looking to enhance. So the proposed design for uh, the multi-use path system and the buffer uh, is a 12-foot path and an 8-foot buffer where it's feasible. So uh, we really tried to prioritize this section uh, in that corridor between Marine 38th Street and then the South Boulder Creek. Uh, the challenge we have with doing that is that there is uh, sections of the roadway where right of way is constrained. And so uh, we engaged in a community, we engaged in a community engagement process. <laughs> That's a lot of engagement. And, uh, and really entered the SEEP process to determine how best to address those places where the right of way is constrained. And uh, we talked to uh, residents at two public meetings and uh, 
at several TAB meetings, which I will review in a minute. Uh, the picture on the bottom of this slide is a plan view of the uh, proposed design between MacArthur Drive and 48th Street. So this is just across the street from Boulder Community Health, just east of Foothills Parkway. You can see in this plan design, we also are including some curb extensions at MacArthur Drive. And so I'll describe um, the process with those in a moment. So these are uh, plan views of the proposed design. So like I said, uh, on the left-hand side, you see the intersection of MacArthur Drive and Arapahoe Avenue showing the curb extensions and the eight foot uh, buffer with the 10 or 12 foot multi-use path. Um, we heard through our engagement process that the preferred uh, landscaping in the buffer should be lower maintenance, uh, what we call Zeriscape. So um, we're proposing uh, a series of trees and low maintenance plantings in that, uh, in that buffer between the multi-use path and the, uh, and the street. On the right-hand side of this uh, slide, you'll see two pictures. So in the top right-hand corner is one of those sections where we have constrained right-of-way. Um, so this is actually just east of 55th Street on the south side of the street in front of the Conoco gas station. And so in these constrained sections, we uh, unfortunately are unable to provide that preferred buffer that I just described. Um, and so we would be looking to install a hardscape buffer, uh, which would be about two feet between the multi-use path and the street surface. Um, most of the hardscape is uh, east of 55th Street. Uh, the bottom right-hand picture is uh, on the north side, just east of 56th Street. Um, one thing to note is that on, fifth, on Arapahoe, east of 55th, there are on-street bike lanes. And so um, while the buffer is very thin in, in some areas here, there is additional space between pedestrians on the path and the actual travel lane. So I just did want to note that. And then, of course, where we do have uh, the right-of-way available, then we go back to the preferred buffer uh, uh, section. Uh, so you can see in the lower right hand corner, uh, that's is a section where the right of way line uh, shifts north. And so we do gain a little more room to then provide that more comfortable buffer from traffic. So uh, we uh, conducted our community engagement at the consult level. Um, so what that means is that uh, we took a lot of input from uh, the community through two public meetings, a Be Heard Boulder questionnaire, on a Be Heard, um, the Be Heard webpage, as well as on the project webpage. Um, and we've had, uh, including this tab presentation, three tab presentations, and then of course, today's public hearing. Um, so we've had a lot of touch points with the community on this project. And the consult level really is uh, taking that input and reflecting it in the development of the preferred alternative. Um, whereas the inform level is is more of you create an alternative and then ask the community for any additional concerns they may have before you go ahead and, and begin the design and uh, engineering of it. The consult level is really um, a higher level uh, engagement where you're asking residents to give us some feedback that we can then use to finalize the alternative. So in the engagement process, we uh, covered three options, as you may recall. Um, and so again, the preferred option was that 12 foot path and eight foot buffer. Um, the other two options focused on either a narrower buffer or a narrower path. And so we really wanted to uh, balance those two options based on the input we heard. And that input was that both are important and that was pretty evenly split across all of our engagement meetings. We also asked the community for input and feedback on how best to uh, create a buffer between the multi-use path and the travel lanes. And so again, the preferred option here that we heard from the community was the trees in Zeriscape in the middle picture you see before you. And so um, we've prioritized that in places where we can. And again, um, 
where right of way is constrained, we do have to unfortunately, extremely constrained, I should say, we do unfortunately have to uh, go forward with the hardscape, but in limited sections. We also additionally asked for uh, feedback from residents on uh, transit stops and unsignalized crossings. So these aren't actually, these aren't included in the seat document uh, that was attached to your uh, to the memo for this uh, agenda item in the packet. But uh, but we are moving forward with enhancing transit stops in the corridor to uh, both improve the comfort of existing transit service and hopefully encourage more ridership. And so um, what we heard through our engagement process was that seating was uh, the most uh, important option for folks in uh, considering the upgrade of those transit stops. And so uh, we've added benches at many, if not most of the um, stops along the corridor, and then uh, also prioritized shelter upgrades where the ridership uh, warrants it. We have additionally included uh, trash cans and uh, bike racks where we felt that they'd be warranted. So bike racks near uh, existing or proposed bike infrastructure, and then trash cans uh, near places where people may have refuse to get rid of, for example, near uh, some of the commercial properties in the corridor where people might buy like a sandwich or a coffee or something. Uh, for unsignalized crossings, uh, we asked folks about uh, raised crossings, raised crosswalks, uh, curb extensions, as well as um, tighter turning radii at the corners. So basically a tighter corner to turn around, which would slow vehicles down as they turn. And so uh, we heard that basically uh, all of those were important and that um, you know, making the crossings safer and more comfortable for pedestrians was uh, one of the most important things that we could do. Uh, so we have uh, looked at the turn, the turning radii for the corners, and we'll be tightening those up. And then um, added the curb extensions at MacArthur, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, unfortunately, with the raised crosswalks, those were a little more difficult to. Uh, include in this project because of the existing floodplains in the corridor and uh, places where we would think they would be most effective, unfortunately, uh, were hardest to include them because of those floodplains. So uh, the SEEP process kicked off uh, in January of this year uh, with an in interdepartmental design kickoff meeting. And so um, again, the engagement process that we went through in March and May and at uh, tab meetings uh, this previous summer and spring were really part of that uh, process where we were assessing impacts to, um, to the uh, community on, based on this project. And so uh, some of those impacts we assessed were environmental, social, fiscal, and we assessed those against uh, the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as well as the Transportation Master Plan. You can see in the picture on the right, um, so the pluses were a positive impact to the negatives where a negative impact on zero would be a uh, uh, no impact or a wash. <laughs> so so, um, so we, uh, we went through that process and uh, met with our interdepartmental review committee uh, last month to talk about uh, feedback from individual departments. Uh, one thing that we heard pretty clearly from planning and development services was that um, for the Xeris uh, option that we are uh, proposing this evening, we, uh, we do need to make sure that we public engagement meetings earlier this year, we had messaged that as uh, rocks and shrubbery and trees and. And unfortunately, uh, rocks and gravel are not permitted by code anymore. And so we would need to be focusing on mulch or some other kind of ground cover in these areas. The other uh, major feedback we received from the committee was that uh, we need to begin the floodplain permit process as soon as possible, um, given the uh, timeline associated with this project because of its relationship to a federal grant. Um, the permits could potentially uh, be longer than we're expecting. And if we're not um, diligent with our timelines, we could run into uh, to issues with our uh, funding agencies there. 
So this evening, uh, we'll hold or you'll hold a public hearing um, prior to considering a recommendation on this SEEP. Um, and so if you approve the SEEP, we will uh, make a presentation to City Council on September 21st. And City Council uh, reserves the right to call up the project if they choose. Um, assuming that the SEEP is approved by you and not called up by City Council um, in the process um, it doesn't start over, then we will begin the final design engineering, uh, final design and engineering at the end of this year with construction uh, slated for 2023. And I'll take any question and questions you may have at this point before uh, you open up the public hearing. Thank you, Ryan. Um, my only question is about the places where the right of way is so constrained that we have to do hardscape and stamped and colored concrete. And my question is, why would we do that instead of just making it a wider sidewalk? Is it for visual purposes? Is it so it technically counts as a um, detached sidewalk? Um, why is it preferable to do it that way instead of making a wider available area for, for pedestrians? So I believe we need to maintain an eight foot minimum uh, width to maintain a multi-use path per our uh, design and construction standards. But I will ask Brian Wiltshire if he wants to weigh in on that as well. So Tila, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're asking about the two foot colored buffer concrete. Um, so that buffer is really intended for kind of a vertical obstruction. Um, so we tried to keep 18 inches clear from the edge of a path. So if somebody was riding on the path with their handlebar sticking out over the edge of it, that they're not going to come in conflict with say a car or something else traveling in the lane of travel. And so that's really kind of a, a protective measure that we provide that two foot buffer. And in other places, if it's not concrete, we would still provide a, um, you know, landscape buffer or something else from the edge of the path to any vertical obstruction. So that's really what that's intended for. Okay, <laughs> not sure I understand the benefit of it so much, but um, all right. Does anyone else have questions? Mark, you've unmuted. Um, I'm going to have some comments later on. My only question mm -hmm. is a clarifying one. Uh, and that is when you look at the cross sections that are presented uh, in each right hand lane, east and westbound, there is a bus presented and uh, it kind of indicates that that is a bus lane. But as I understand it, and I, uh, this is a question for Ryan to confirm, these are not, uh, as it currently stands, this is essentially a six lane state highway and the right-hand lanes are multi-purpose lanes, not dedicated to buses or right-hand turn lanes, correct? That is correct. Currently, the configuration is that the outer lanes on Arapahoe are multi-purpose lanes. Okay, that's, that's my only, go ahead. Oh, and then Tila, um, so, so I would just add, um, you know, I think we, we do want to, provide a buffer between the multi-use path and the travel lands. I, I hear your, your question about why include the buffer at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I would say, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but I, I think, you know, we, we generally try to provide that buffer for comfort purposes to make it more comfortable and attractive for folks to walk and ride on these multi-use paths. Garrett, did you raise your hand? He did. Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer. I just wanted to add an additional reason that for uh, design and construction purposes, that buffer is often placed there is for utilities. So a lot of times we find street light poles that are placed inside that buffer or utility poles. Sometimes it's utility vaults. If we can relocate utilities to sit there and instead of the multi-use path, that's a preferable condition. So um, those, those are other sort of, uh, I would say on the ground physical reasons for providing a buffer if possible. Okay, thank you. Ryan, this is, Ryan, this is yeah. Hutch. I have a, a different uh, kind of question. I'm curious, 
given the location of where we're working, whether ball aerospace, the community hospital, and the two big apartment complexes there, you know, as institutions uh, provided you with much in the way of, uh, of, of input, because it strikes me that th those places in particular might influence uh, the mix of usage of this, uh, of, of this improvement. Yeah, we did not hear from uh, any of the large institutions. We, we did try to do some outreach um, to them, but as far as I recall, no one um, from those institutions who was in any kind of decision-making capacity was engaged in our meetings. Uh, we did hear from some small business owners and actually met with one on site, um, and that would have that was an owner that was uh, east of 56th Street on the north side of Arabo. Um, but yeah, we did not we did not hear from the larger institutions. Great, thanks. Okay, Mark had a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I I, I forgot okay. a second part of my question about those right hand lanes. Oh, um, uh, and I had asked this of Ryan earlier today, and I don't know if there's any uh, anyone that can contribute to this. Um, do we have a record of rear end collisions in those right hand lanes of cars crashing into buses at bus stops, cars crashing into each other at right hand turns, uh, et cetera? Do we have a do we have any uh, crash data that suggests we have a uh, a problem in those right-hand lanes. So I, uh, I emailed um, our operations group, um, Devin Jocelyn, and uh, I don't know if they've had a chance to dig into some data yet, um, but we can get back to you on that, Mark. I, didn't, I don't know if we had that readily available though. Thank you. I'm not sure that any of that information would affect your the scoring on the seat portion of this project. Is that right? I do not believe it would have affected that, no. Okay. Any other questions, Tab, before we open up a public hearing here on this item? Okay, seeing none, we do have a number of uh, members of the public on board. I don't know if they're here for this item or the next one. I see one or two hands raised. Um, so we will do our usual three minutes per person. Uh, as before, if you don't need all three minutes, your brevity is valued and appreciated, um, but we can go ahead and open this up to members of the public starting with Sue, it looks like. Okay, just one minute, Teal. Let me get us back on our timer. And do you need me to stop sharing my screen for the moment or? Um, yeah, uh, maybe Ryan. Yeah, maybe that'll be a little easier for folks to see their time. Yeah, okay. sounds good. All right. Sue, there you are. Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> Sorry, yes. excuse me. Um, I'll be really quick. Uh, I served on the East Arapahoe uh, committee that met with Gene for it was like two years, I think. It was very long. Anyway, it was it was the whole plan. It was the the roadway and the multi-use path and everything. And it was a, a big plan. But um, what I wanted to say right now was I'm really glad to see the bike portion implemented first and um, something we've been looking for for a long time. And I'm really glad to see that implemented ahead of the rest of the large project. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. I don't see I'm anyone not, else. Yeah, I'm not seeing anyone else, Tila. All right. We will close out the public hearing on this item then and open this up to board discussion. Um, I know that Alex sent an email earlier today with his items um, proposing changes. And I suppose my first question, I guess, to uh, Natalie or Ryan um, was if those are the changes that Alex suggests, which we will get into for, for benefit of everyone who hasn't seen the email. Um, but in, in just looking over that list of, of tweaks, I suppose, would you consider any of those major revisions that would require uh, 
having to redo a portion of the seep. I'll let Ryan speak to that. Okay. I don't think that any of those uh, suggestions would require us redoing the seep. Um, I think, you know, the seep is taking the project in, in a whole. Um, so those details are not, uh, they're specific enough that I don't think it affects, you know, taking the, considering the impacts of the project as a whole. Um, you know, one thing that uh, we've discussed and we've talked, Alex and I spoke about this the other day, um, is that, you know, we do, we do have a limited budget and, uh, you know, oftentimes when you have uh, the limited amount of money and you put a project out to bid that, um, you know, the bids come in higher than the, the money you have available. And so, so we did discuss that some of those uh, sections then, because they have um, existing older path would, would be ones that we could potentially de-scope from the project. The okay. Alex, would this be a good time for you to jump in and explain your thinking on some of those items? I know you've been in some discussions on the side with certain people. Sure, and I the email that you saw today was, I only sent to you as far as tab members. Ah, okay. though, I was, I included you and not everyone else because it was mostly based on conversations I'd had on the phone with um, staff and then we had talked about it more recently privately. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm a little confused as to when is the best time to provide this type of feedback and if a um, smaller design considerations are things that could be included in a motion with the approval of SEEP with, as I understand it, it, you're hoping to have it out to bid in about 10 months. So it seems like we're getting kind of late for things to be changed or omitted. Um, but I also at the same time, I support the option one cross section with the 12 foot path and the eight foot buffer and option two for the landscaping with the combination of trees and zero scaping. Um, <clears throat> what I've been curious throughout this process about is this has been advertised as the initial step of the fuller vision outlined in the East Arapaho transportation plan. And I like the creative, creative uh, approach, I think Sue pointed out of building the bicycle head bike infrastructure first and then filling in the rest later. Uh, what I just want to be cautious about is that we're building as much as possible today that will align with that future uh, vision, which includes the introduction of transit only lanes on the right side of the street and a protected bike lane in between this multi-use path and the roadway. And so what I went ahead and did was as best I could sketch to scale that proposed cross section on top of the proposed plans to see if the, <clears throat> excuse me, if the initial alignments leave enough room in the middle of the roadway for those things. And in some places I thought that they did, um, some I thought they could be tweaked. And then there are a couple of locations where I feel like the benefit of constructing, uh, widening or introducing a multi-use path aren't uh, all that beneficial until we're able to do some other improvements. So um, if those types of comments are welcome now, I could, uh, if Ryan wanted to pull up the, um, <clears throat> the, the plan view slides, I could comment on a couple of places throughout the corridor that I found um, I would probably recommend doing something slightly different. Yeah, give me a second here. Alex. To the extent that this probably doesn't affect how the project scores or mm -hmm. you know where where it falls on whether we approve the SEEP or not, is it possible to sideline this particular blow by blow conversation, assuming that Alex's input is welcome and appropriate at this point? Does it have to happen at this meeting? <laughs> yeah, so, I think, sorry. Go ahead. So I was just gonna say, I mean, I think if Alex feels comfortable, you know, recommending for approval the SEEP, knowing that, you know, 
his some of the design comments or detailed design comments that he has, you know, could be a conversation that we have. I mean, I don't know that we're going to promise tonight that we're going to, you know, do everything that he's asking for with each mm -hmm. of the design considerations, but it's something we can look at and consider. Um, if he feels comfortable enough with that, then I think um, we could sideline it and have that conversation uh, after the fact. But yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, if I'm trying to stay on task for what, what the ask is of us tonight. And it's basically a way in on mm -hmm. design options one, two, and three about, you know, the preferred um, width of the path and then the buffer material options, again, options one through three, and then whether or not given all that, we approve the seat. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I think Natalie responded to Alex's email earlier saying that, you know, earlier is better. It's, you know, it will come back to tab, but it might be too late to make real design changes. And my understanding from talking to Alex was that the basis of his suggested design changes in his email today was um, taking a look at other pre-existing plans and making sure that what we're trying to do in the future does mesh with what we're doing here. And he had concerns that we might be putting things, you know, a few feet too far to the, to the left or right. Um, and that seems like valuable input, but it doesn't seem to me to, to be um, germane to the question of, do we approve the seat? Do we have opinions on these you know, options for the buffer? Is that fair, Alex and Natalie? I think yeah, so. I, I agree with that. Yeah. I, one concern is a couple of the things I've proposed are not building certain segments. And right. I wouldn't want a decision on staff ends to be made by a private conversation I have with them and other board members not be able to weigh in on something like that. So I agree that I'm probably, this is probably like a post seep thing, but this is gonna move pretty quickly. And I don't know if this is gonna come back to tab in time. And a lot of these things that I am uh, recommending would mean probably less work for staff in a lot of places. And so I wouldn't want staff to further the current approach to 100% design and then myself for TAP as a whole way in and us recommend doing away with some of the things that staff has spent time working on. Yeah, and I understand that. So I think maybe the best thing to do is um, we can have this conversation in like the next agenda setting meeting about what the right timing is that we potentially come back um, during preliminary engineering and um, we can have that conversation with the whole board. That sounds good to me. And since I've taken up bunch of time already. I do support, as I mentioned, the proposed cross-section and landscaping approach. Okay. Mark, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I, I have a fear. And my fear is that um, at some point in the future, someone comes back and says, well, TAB approved this seat. And this, the fact that the buffer isn't the way that Alex suggested it or the way, I, what I'm worried is um, that there is a tension between uh, getting into the weeds and micromanaging. And I have this similar comment on, on other agenda topics tonight and taking such a high view uh, and meeting our uh, agenda requirements and our schedule requirements that uh, we are at a later date, deeply disappointed that our recommendations weren't taken into account or were somehow decided outside of a public forum and hearing. So if, if Alex is comfortable, I'm comfortable. I raised my hand while Alex was agreeing, but I, I dearly do not, when I read the requested action, staff is looking uh, staff is seeking a recommendation to the city council regarding the state highway seven east Arapahoe road multi use path and transit stop so we're looking for recommendation findings from this motion will be presented to city council for acceptance at their September 21 meeting. So as long as there's this great pool of time and uh, discussion and uh, we can make adjustments that we get to actually um, vote on. This is our moment of voting. I am, I am uh, uh, cautious about voting when there are things of import 
that are being pushed off to a later date and yet our findings will be presented on September 21st. That's well taken, Mark. Um, and it's uh, unfortunate that, you know, the seep just happens in this order. Um, and I am confident that we're not gonna have the kind of time lag that we had on say 28th Street. Um, where you know a, a seep approval from 10 or 12 or however many years ago it was it got sort of held over our heads when we wanted to change some of the designs last minute this is how the the, the scheduling and the process is set up and it's a, a perpetual problem um i'm not well, sure final, how to solve that Will the final designer a 90 plus percent design come to tap for a formal recommendation in the future? Here, do you want to answer that question about um, timing of next steps of when we would come back to tab with preliminary engineering? Yes, so it would be atypical to come back for formal recommendation on a final design for our projects after they've gone through a SEEP. But uh, uh, perhaps what we could do is come back with a, 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 a informal, maybe perhaps uh, matters from staff type of an agenda item to uh, get input from TAB officially um, uh, on the design so that it can be incorporated to the extent possible before it goes to construction. Can we commit to that? Uh, staff's willing to commit to that, yes. Mark, yeah, that satisfies you. That's lovely. See, that's why we work together. Okay. That being said, Mark, um, before uh, before I move on to other members, did you have um, comments or feedback about the the preferred um, options um, in the memo? Yes, I think they're on page eight or so. Yes, and and I want to I want to begin with the. Um, uh, saying that as I studied this today uh, and I looked at other six lane state highway uh, projects where we're dealing with uh, cycling, uh, uh, transit and auto traffic mixed together. Uh, I was reminded of uh, 28th Street the um, adding a third lane for bus and right turn only. I was reminded of Broadway, uh, Highway 93, south of Baseline, and the uh, uh, intersection treatments of Broadway and Rayleigh. And, uh, and I, I was reminded of a quote that uh, uh, foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Uh, but I think about these three different state highways and the, and the ways we've treated uh, pedestrian and cycling safety and bus right turn lanes. And um, I, I look at the, uh, uh, back on uh, slide number 10 uh, in this presentation, I believe it's 10 and in my original one, it was the one, there we go, right there. Uh, no, go back, go, I'm sorry, go down one forward, one more, there we go. Okay, um, there at the bottom, uh, it's shown uh, three uh, crossings. I see a sharply radius uh, car turning right onto a sharply radius turn with pedestrians in a, uh, a narrow crossing. In the, in the center image, I see uh, uh, a narrowed street with, um, uh, pedestrians in the crossing and, and uh, a pedestrian and a, and a cycling lane uh, coming together there. Uh, but a particularly slow moving, uh, if I was in an automobile, I would be moving quite slowly. Um, I, so I would request, and maybe this is an item for our subsequent design review, that we consider several things. One, is that there, I, I can't think of a reason that we shouldn't have uh, 
on an interim basis, convert the right-hand travel lane to a bus and right turn only lane. Um, we have plenty of uh, auto capacity in the, uh, in the two uh, east and westbound, additional east and westbound lanes. Um, and I think that that answers uh, a lot of other questions about uh, right turning vehicles and uh, uh, concerns with, gee, is someone uh, coming up at high speed behind me? Um, I would also uh, consider that, you know, if we're in a very similar situation where we have wanted when we rebuild uh, uh, 28th Street, we want to accommodate transit. And so we have committed to building dedicated bus and right-hand turn lanes. And I think this is consistent with that. And finally, I think that the design elements as proposed on Arapahoe are superior to the design elements that we incorporated at Broadway and Rayleigh, which is a, uh, an additional a fourth lane and um, uh, an additional, even though it's now currently a, a right turn on green arrow only, that will change once they get the programming figured out for the lights, uh, a high speed slip lane and highly radius turns. So I think that we have an opportunity on Arapahoe to incorporate design elements that help us meet our goals for transit, for, for Vision Zero and for um, uh, reducing VMT. And I, I don't think that the current, uh, by, uh, by continuing with three lanes each direction without a bus lane and right turn only lane, um, uh, I, I don't think we meet, we meet that. Our, we don't uh, move forward on our goals. So, I would request that as we move forward in the design, we try to incorporate uh, as many design elements uh, in slowing down of right turns, protected left-hand turns uh, at these intersections so that we actually end up with a superior product on Arapahoe than what we have uh, on 28th Street or uh, South or on Broadway. Yeah, Mark, I, uh, so after our discussion earlier, I. Uh, checked in on that item as well. And uh, so it does sound like that is on the table once we start the design process with CDOT next year. The interim bus lane and right, the bad lanes. And so I would ask Tab, thank you, Ryan. I, I appreciate your input on that. And I appreciate you taking my call today and discussing that with me. It helped me uh, bring my thoughts together. So, uh, as a board, as an advisory board, I wanna make sure that we don't miss an opportunity. In general, I'm, I'm in favor of approving the seat and sending it on to council. I want the board to consider, are there elements uh, that we feel are important that are incorporated in our comments to council? It can be tab approved the seat uh, with the following uh, recommendations. I want to make sure we don't miss an opportunity uh, to voice those those concerns. So, Mark, what I've been trying to get us to to pin down is whether, when there are choices between a wider path and a narrower buffer, or a narrower path and a wider buffer, do you have a feeling on those? Because that's one of the options they're trying to to okay. pin down as part of the preferred design option. Wider path, narrower buffer. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else on tab want to weigh in on the seep and in particular the question I just posed to Mark Hetch? You've unmuted first. Well done. Oh, just just to say to me that's a no-brainer that we go with wider path. Great. Any other uh, feedback on elements of the seep? Not really. I mean. Uh, not not to take up any time here, but I'm I'm trying to think of things that will beyond hardware that will 
really help us increase usage, but that's not what we're really trying to decide today. And that was the basis of my clarifying question earlier. So uh, I, I want to just consider that angle. To me, the, the, the hardscape stuff is fine, but isn't really going to drive usage hugely anyway. OK, thanks. Ryan, I haven't heard from you on this yet. Do you have any input? I, I don't think I have anything to add. I, 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 uh, I think I'm mostly in support of, of what I've heard Mark say um, and on the, the wider path versus, versus the buffer space. So no, I don't have anything to add at this point. OK, great. Uh, I also support wider paths and narrower buffer when possible. That was partly why I was asking, you know, do we really need the stamped concrete? Because it tends to concentrate people in a, in a slightly narrower area. Um, I think that um, staff has, has made a decent enough case for, for why uh, they want to keep it that way. And um, I, in general, am in support of, of uh, the current SEEP. Uh, I do appreciate staff's willingness to come back to us earlier than usual and earlier than typical um, as this moves toward final design and uh, bring it to us when the design is less final than it might have been. Um, if there's no further discussion, I would like to entertain a motion on the seat. Ryan, do you need any further details from us or any further? Uh, um, are there any other choices to make that I, I missed? I don't think so. I think we are just waiting for an approval from you that we can um, take to city council. Okay. Well, it sounds like in general, we are in favor of approval of the SEEP. Does anyone want to make a formal motion? I will. Thanks, Mark. Second. <laughs> Wait, I haven't made the motion yet. <laughs> well, whatever it is, it's going to be good. <laughs> I'm just trying to help Tila. Move that. Okay. <laughs> urge, urge me to move along. huh? Uh, so I, I will make the motion that is uh, on the screen in front of us. Um, it's not really quite a motion, though. No. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, I, I will say uh, tab. Um, Tab approves of the State Highway 7 East Arapahoe Road multi use path and transit, and transit stop seats. Transit stops seat, comma, with the ability to provide additional design input at our, um, I don't want to say next because that may be too constricted. Um, uh, at the next appropriate meeting. End of motion. <laughs> I'll second the motion. Um, and then is uh, if there are amendments, then we would do that uh, while the motion is under consideration, which is, I, I believe, now that I've seconded it, where we're at. I'm not sure next uh, appropriate meeting is all that clear. Um, I, yeah, I'm struggling with that. Right, um, yeah. So um, the next phase of the process is to go into preliminary engineering. So perhaps we just say during, or Tab could say during preliminary engineering. That's a friendly amendment by our deputy director. <laughs> uh, as the sponsor, and how does that sound to you, Mark? I would accept that. Okay. Is that clear to Meredith? 
Yes, I'm seeing yes. All right, do we have any discussion on the motion? Lovely, all in favor? One, two, three, let me switch tabs. A uh, unanimous, thank you very much, appreciated. On we go. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, let me just- Thanks, Natalie. Tabs. Yeah. And then Ryan's not gonna go anywhere because we're now moving into item five. Uh, the public hearing about the NSMP projects, the 2021 simple projects. And that is where I believe we do have members of the public who are waiting to weigh in. Uh, we're gonna do this the same way we did the last item. That is, we're gonna have a presentation by Ryan, um, background of the projects, he's gonna run through the simple projects um, and the staff recommendation. Uh, Tab will have a chance to ask clarifying questions uh, and then once those questions are done and we think we know what it is that we're, we're looking for, um, for discussion on, we will open it up to a public hearing for members of the public to speak to us. We have received a number of um, emails and letters on this, um, including right up to you know, a couple hours before this meeting. We have looked those over, um, but I know that uh, for the members of the public who want to have their voices really heard, this is going to be your chance. So, and then after the public hearing, then we will close the public hearing and then TAB will deliberate and um, on, on the recommended projects and make a, make a recommendation. Okay, Ryan, I think it's all yours. All right, thank you again. Um, and just for anyone who's joining, my name is Ryan Knowles, Senior Transportation Planner here at the City of Boulder, Department of Transportation and Mobility. And I, um, run the Neighborhood Speed Management Program, which is the city's traffic calming program. And so we'll just do a quick background and purpose on the NSMP, talk a little bit about uh, speed humps, which are the uh, traffic calming device we're proposing for these projects this evening. Uh, briefly touch on the proposals by location, talk about next steps, and then again, have a question period for the board before the board opens the public hearing and then of discussion on the projects. So the purpose of the Neighborhood Speed Management Program is to reduce vehicle speeds. And the reason uh, we want to reduce vehicle speeds in neighborhoods is to improve uh, safety and the quality of life in Boulder's neighborhoods. So for people who are uh, walking, biking, rolling, playing, because neighborhoods are places and neighborhood streets are often used as places, uh, we see res residential streets as shared spaces. And so it's important for us to make sure that uh, there is no excessive speeding or reckless driving on these streets. Uh, the NSMP supports uh, and is identified in the Transportation Master Plan and is part of our Vision Zero program um, to reduce serious injuries and fatal crashes to zero. I want to note that uh, all of these projects are resident driven, meaning that uh, folks are reaching out to the city to address speeding on their neighborhood streets through an application process that includes a petition. We have a benchmark for uh, including a project in the traffic calming program each year. And so that is an 85th percentile speed of three miles an hour or more over the speed limit. So for streets with a 20 mile an hour speed limit, that speed is 23 miles an hour. For streets with a 25 mile an hour speed limit, so that would be Walnut Street in this presentation, that's 28 miles an hour. 85th percentile speed is a uh, benchmark speed that uh, is used in traffic engineering. And so it's a speed up to which 85% of traffic is traveling. Conversely, 15% um, of traffic is going over that speed. There are two types of projects in the NSMP, simple and complex projects. Uh, the most basic difference is that simple projects are uh, lower cost, so around $15,000 and are not on emergency response routes. And uh, as I mentioned, we do collect data beforehand to get at that qualifying benchmark speed. And then also to look at traffic volumes, we do an after evaluation to determine whether or not the traffic calming devices the speed humps that we install are effective, and uh, if there are any changes in traffic volumes. And then I just want to note that, again, um, because of 20 is 20, we do have a lot of projects. Um, and so we are going to be discussing seven tonight. There are more on the simple project list that we are 
uh, hoping to address this year as well. Just a quick overview of what a speed hump is. Um, so a speed hump is a 12 foot wide uh, raised parabolic uh, hump of asphalt, essentially. It is about 3.5 inches tall. So it's very different than the speed bumps that you would see uh, in a parking lot of a Target or some other uh, store that basically force you to come to a full stop before you drive over it. Uh, those are like one to three feet wide and uh, are very, very jarring if you drive over them fast. Whereas we advise folks to drive over the speed humps we install on neighborhood streets between 15 and 20 miles an hour, depending on your vehicle. Um, but a speed in there should feel fairly, fairly comfortable based on the design that we, we use. So uh, these are the proposed streets in this year's simple project program. Um, so you can see they uh, mostly cover uh, all the neighborhoods or most geographic areas of the city of Boulder with the exception of Gun Barrel. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, we have paused South 32nd Street. Um, so we are actually going to be conducting an additional speed study this week for that street. Uh, the reason we paused it was because in uh, our engagement process, talking to residents, um, we were looking at the data and we noticed that there was a scoring error when we prioritized projects uh, earlier this year that we uh, miscounted the, num the average number of speeding vehicles. And so that changed the priority of Saint or South 32nd Street, um, putting another street that we hadn't included in this program uh, before. it. And so we wanted to make sure one, um, that we went back and collected uh, accurate data. So another uh, factor was that um, South 32nd Street was using some older data. Uh, that's not the case for other streets in this program. And that we also gave an opportunity for that street, um, which is Lincoln Place on the Hill, uh, an opportunity to, uh, to get traffic calming this year as well. So uh, following our speed study this year, or this week rather, we will um, hold a second neighborhood forum the week of September 27th. And then uh, we'll do this uh, type of presentation and a public hearing at the October 11th tab meeting. So I just wanted to quickly touch on the proposals for each of the seven streets that we're talking about this evening. Um, and so uh, I can talk in more detail about these if you have questions, uh, but basically for Fifth Street, we are proposing three speed humps. You can see in the map on the left. Um, and so our feedback on these projects, uh, or these speed humps rather for Fifth Street has generally been favorable. And so we feel comfortable uh, making this proposal going forward. Uh, the same for 29th Street, we are proposing, sorry about that, my dog is being ornery. Um, <laughs> um, we're proposing one speed hump. Uh, so this is just south of Glenwood Drive. Uh, the application uh, form called for Glenwood Drive between Belmont Road, um, but we're actually not proposing adding a speed hump south of the curve uh, that you see in the map, uh, which would be just north of Valmont Road because we didn't have any petition signatures uh, in that section of the street. And so um, we were unclear about if there was support to move forward with the speed um, uh, in the, on that section of 29th. For Delwood Avenue, the map that you see here um, left is north. So, um, Broadway is on the top of the map, uh, so up is east. Uh, we're proposing two speed humps here, um, and this is uh, just east of 9th Street. As you may recall, we installed a speed hump on Delwood Avenue west of 9th Street around 7th, uh, just north of North Boulder Park. Next, uh, we have Laramie Boulevard. Um, so, uh, we are proposing four speed humps on Laramie. Uh, so again, uh, same orientation with the map, up is east and left is north. And so uh, the first speed hump is just after the curve. Um, so if you're driving on Laramie, you turn off Broadway and there's a curve and then it straightens up. And the first speed hump is recommended there, uh, east of Chimney. And then 
We have three more uh, up to uh, the intersection of Fifth Street. Next, uh, so uh, this is Ludlow Street. The application was for Totley uh, to Knox. Uh, the petition included signatures uh, from households on both sections of the street, uh, east and west of Hastings Drive. And so initially, we had proposed two speed umps uh, for this section of Ludlow. However, through our engagement process, uh, we heard from uh, folks that they did not want speed umps on the street. And so in uh, speaking with the residents and, and talking about um, the details of the project and then really looking at uh, where folks were and then digging into the data, we determined that uh, most of the folks who weren't excited about the speed humps and more concerned about other uh, tra transportation issues in the neighborhood uh, lived west of Hastings, whereas uh, the folks who did want to see speed humps installed were really east of Hastings. We uh, dug into the data and, and noticed that uh, speeding was higher on, um, on Ludlow east of Hastings. And so we felt comfortable with the half closure existing at Knox and Ludlow, um, removing that proposed speed hump west of Hastings. And so now we are only proposing the one uh, near 4445 four, four, Ludlow Street. Next, uh, we're proposing one speed hump uh, between 11th and uh, 9th Street on Pine Street. Um, and so, as you uh, may recall, uh, this section of Pine Street is a little bit different than uh, east of 11th, where the street is ac actually changes classifications, becomes a collector, and is uh, just much busier. There are more institutions like uh, the Carnegie Library at the corner, for example. Um, but west of 11th, it really is much more residential in uh, nature. And so um, we are proposing uh, one speed hump in this location. And then last but not least, we are proposing three speed humps on Walnut. So Walnut is, um, the, uh, is a collector and has a 25 mile an hour speed limit. It's the only street in this listing of projects that has a 20, 25 mile an hour speed limit. The rest have a 20 mile an hour speed limit due to the 20 is plenty project. Uh, so our proposal initially was for five speed homes between Folsom and uh, 20th. However, um, in discussions with our transportation maintenance crews um, and supervisor, we determined that um, because it's a secondary snow removal route and the way that we windrow snow to the middle of the street, um, five speed humps would be uh, a larger impact on the, uh, the, on the work group, creating uh, you know probably a delay in snow removal to be honest, and then additionally um, you know some concerns about doing it well. So uh, because of that 25 mile hour speed limit, we determined that three uh, based on this spacing should be effective in reducing the 85th percentile speed to near or at 25 miles an hour. So again, uh, we are holding a public hearing this evening, as well as on October 11th. And um, both this evening and on the 11th, we'll ask TAB to recommend which projects we should implement. Um, those projects that are recommended for implementation, uh, we intend to implement this fall. Um, so we are, especially for the October meeting, um, going to uh, do our best to get those implemented this fall, um, though we are running into um, the end of the asphalt season. So um, just as a aside. And then of course, we will uh, evaluate and gather feedback on all these projects, uh, both quantitative and qualitative data um, as we go forward. And so uh, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thanks, Ryan. Tab, any questions? Let me scroll through. Ryan, go ahead. That, oh, thanks. Um, Ryan, just one, this is a super basic question. Uh, it's a general question. Do we, um, when we create the speed humps, have an option to make a, uh, I don't know what you call it, but like a, a cut through it so bikes can pass through. And is that, is that part of the consideration? Um, 
I don't know, just to make them easier for through travelers. So I know that's not specific to these to these specific projects, but would appreciate understanding that better. Yes, we uh, so we uh, do install uh, that type of speed hump, uh, which we call a speed cushion. So those have uh, cutouts in the hump, and typically they're spaced for emergency vehicles. Um, so we're actually intending on installing quite a few of those on 26th Street and 55th Street later this year. Um, but uh, we could certainly consider, you know, especially perhaps where we have overlays with green streets, installing speed cushions so that cyclists can ride through the cutouts. Um, because of the design of the traverse speed humps, the ones without the cutouts, we we haven't found that unless you're just like a phenomenal cyclist that they um, kind of create a lot of impact. Sorry, my dog is not doing great. Um, but that's certainly something we can do. Okay, Th thanks for that. Thanks for the explainer, appreciate it. Thanks, anyone else, Tab? No, no, no. Okay, Ryan, I have a couple of questions. Um, as I mentioned, we've gotten a lot of emails and letters, um, as we often do on these projects. And one theme that um, emerged was that several people raised ice and drainage issues um, with the speed humps. And I was wondering if you could comment on, it sounds like you've been, been having conversations with maintenance um, staff. Can you comment on what, what the impacts, if any, there are um, when we place these speed humps on snow clearance and ice buildup. Yeah. So uh, so one of the uh, main concerns around drainage was for that speed hump that we were proposing on the um, western section of Ludlow. Uh, so there was a, a concern from a few residents there that there's a lot of drainage issues and that the speed hump might make it worse. Um, so that was also a consideration when we um, decided to remove that one from the proposal in addition to the concerns about um, just not wanting speed humps and other issues. Uh, I would say for snow removal routes, typically um, we don't install, or we haven't in this program installed speed humps on secondary snow removal routes. Um, when I spoke with our transportation maintenance crew, um, they were concerned about the number of speed humps we were initially proposing, which again was five because they felt, they felt like it would um, slow down their operations. Um, again, hand blowing snow in that, uh, on that street. But um, the other thing that they did raise is that um, because of the way that they push snow to the middle of the street and they have to hand blow it, they mentioned that there could be some ice buildup around the speed humps. So, people should be aware of that when they ride. Um, so that was that was something that we raised just to, you know, put it out there. We want to make, want to be transparent about that. Um, they didn't seem to think it would be that big of an issue. So we feel comfortable moving forward with the three speed humps on Walnut Street. Okay, thanks. So my last question is a couple of people writing in about Walnut were suggesting and specifically a stop sign instead of a Speed hump uh, at 23rd and Walnut. Did you have any reaction to um, the effectiveness or desirability of a stop sign instead of a speed hump on Walnut? Yeah, so we'll consider uh, stop signs at intersections um, as people request them through the NSMP, but stop signs are traffic control devices that are meant to manage how people access and move through an intersection. Uh, we don't use them as traffic calming devices. And the reason we don't do that is because again, um, we're really focused on um, making sure that intersections are safe with stop signs. If we start using them mid block or trying to slow people down with them, um, typically people begin to ignore them. Um, and so that becomes an issue, a safety issue in and of itself. Uh, so we, we, don't, we don't recommend using stop signs for traffic calming purposes. So what we'll do for that intersection is determine if a stop sign is warranted there on its own merits. Um, and there are federal warrants that we follow um, to make that determination. Okay, thank you. 
I think that's all I have. And if no other members of TAB have clarifying questions, we'll move on to the public hearing portion. I do see a number of raised hands and I've been seeing some um, talk. Don't worry, Joe Fisher, we'll get to you. So if you can't find the raised hand, just let us know in the chat uh, and we will, we will get to you as we can. Um, we do have a number of people. Typically we give uh, three minutes each um, as before and Tonight, you guys have been lovely in not unnecessarily using all of your time. So if you don't really need all three minutes, I do encourage you to keep your, um, your comments as brief as possible so that we can attend to the numerous other matters we have to get to tonight. But I wanna make sure that you do have a chance to, to say your part. Um, Jenny, are you still on? Yeah, I'm there here too. Are. And it looks like Joe and others were all able to raise. It looks like it, yeah. I believe. Okay, so I, I see you, Joe. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go in order. So okay, first up, you. we will have Craig Millis. Let me start our timer and I'll get you going, Craig. Hey, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the project at Spine Road and South Orchard Creek Circle is um, is currently on the complex projects list. I know this is comments uh, related to the simple projects, but but the the reality is because it's on the complex projects list, nothing has been done uh, regarding uh, the speeding on Spine uh, for several years. So so I would I would ask two things. First, I would ask to, to please consider adding a crosswalk now at Spine and South Orchard Creek Circle, particularly because the, uh, the grade school bus stops have now been moved to Spine and there are kids regularly crossing right there early in the morning during rush hour. And the second thing that I would ask of the board is to please revisit the scoring for this project. The scoring currently shows that there have been no accidents on spine, and that's not correct. There have been accidents on spine within the past few years. And if there were just two accidents counted, which there have been more than two there, it would be the number one complex project on that list. So I, I ask that you'd please consider those two things. I'll yield back my, my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Millis. Nice to see you again. All right, let me restart here and then we will have Steve. All right, Steve, go ahead. Am I there? You are there, go ahead, yeah. Hi, hi. Hey, I apologize for dropping a four page letter in your laps yesterday, which violates like everything about writing an effective letters to your representative. But there was a lot to say on this issue, and I will make my comments here short, which is just that with the, the speed bump issue, um, I feel like this whole program gives people the impression that they own the street in front of their houses. And 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 so if you know everybody thinks they have a speeding problem, I think we have a speeding problem. But when you start erecting obstacles to traffic, it displaces it um, to other streets. And so we all have to get along and not try to push our problems onto other other streets. Um, so so I mean, I live on Fourth Street. We get traffic from people who live at Calmia. The people on Delwood, where you're proposing the speed pumps. Um, they, uh, I travel on Delwood to come up to Fourth. If for, if Delwood gets too blocked, I'll come up to um, I'll come up uh, um, um, Evergreen. Um, but it's not even just the people in the neighborhood that are affected by a, by a single block. Everybody in town drives on Ninth Street to get to North Boulder Park, and we have people from all over the county driving in to drive deliver, delivery trucks, lawn mowing people. And the more we, the more we congest our streets, the more we, um, the more we um, make the whole town impa impassable. Um, I don't think people driving at, a, at you know, an 85 percentile of 26 miles an hour is, is a serious, dangerous problem because it's barely over our former speed limit and the, the, the paint is barely dry on the 25 mile an hour or the 20 mile an hour speed limit signs. 
So, um, and and my you know my last comment about this is there really is very little accounting for dissent. Thirty percent of the neighbors can ask for a speed bump, and it affects people all over the the the, the town and the county. And I I think we need to come up with a better way. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. All right, so let me reset us here and then we're gonna have um, Joe next. All right, Joe, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Great, and, and Joe's not my name, but I, I wanna stay anonymous on this for now. Um, is that okay? Uh, that's a great question. Tila, do you have <laughs> advice on that? Well, uh, the rule is generally to avoid Zoom bombers, and it appears that we're speaking okay. to a live human who wants to speak nope. on the NSMP. That's, that's I'll allow fine. It. Um, oh, okay. Well, thank you. And um, so, so I live on one of the blocks that's being considered, and I've had a lot of conversations um, with um, you know, with Ryan since this has started and with some of my neighbors. And my, my main point is not um, to convince anybody for them or not for them, but I have, I've had some issues with the process. Um, a few things to it is there's no way to vote. You get a certain percentage of neighbors to start the process. Um, there's no qualifications for them. They could be a household of two adults, uh, 10 year old and an 11 year old and that would count for four people from what I was told. Um, so that's one thing is I, I don't feel like there's much of a process there. And then our signs went up um, a few weeks ago. That was the first time I heard about it. One week after that, um, the letter came to our houses. Two weeks after that is when the vote was happening. That's not enough time for neighbors to get informed, to talk about it or do anything like that. Um, another thing is I requested that a speed limit sign go on my block before you guys do the speed test. I wasn't aware it dropped to 20. I don't watch the news. I understand I'm, I'm unique in that way, but my neighbor also wasn't aware. And I asked for that and was told that um, tabs or your engineer's point of view is that you don't feel like speed limit signs actually affect the speeds that people drive. Okay. And I was told you want it to be fair for all of the streets and none of the other streets had it. That's fine too. Um, then earlier, um, Ryan, when you introduced it, you said you can go over a speed hump at 15 or 20 miles an hour. I don't know that that's fully transparent. At 20 miles an hour, it's pretty jarring to me anyway. Um, and 15, okay, maybe, but it's more like 10 or 15 miles an hour over a speed hump in my experience. Um, I understand that's also subjective. Um, $15,000 in one street, you're not going to install this on all the streets. That money could be used in other ways. Put signs up places, put street point paintings places. Um, so anyway, I know my time's up, but I'm, I have a lot of issues with the process and, um, and it's very frustrating for me. Thank you. Can I ask Mr. Fisher, did you yeah. submit written comments? I did. Or I submitted your... written comments okay. and I, I, I sent a letter to my neighborhood with information okay. encouraging them to send feedback to Ryan. Oh, and that's the one other, the last thing is the first, an email from Ryan first said that if half of the people on our block object, they will not be installed. The next email, uh, a couple weeks later, after I sent the letter encouraging people to send feedback, said, no, it's not actually a vote by the neighborhood, even if fewer than 50% of the people want it. TAB can still decide to install it. So I was probably unintentionally misled in the process, but I think there's a lot of things that are not clear and there's not enough time for a neighborhood to come together and make an informed decision. Okay, thank you for uh, your input. Um, part of my reason, there's been some discomfort from other members of the of the board, but I think for good reason, allowing a, um, an anonymous speaker, but to my, the extent that you have- I'm sorry. It's okay. Sir. My, my name is Delian Joffet. I'm on 32nd. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Okay, up next we'll have Ross. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now, Ross. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. 
Um, I think it's, I appreciate going after Joe uh, because I really feel similarly to a lot of his sentiments. I never even received a letter actually. So I had no idea this was going on except that somebody approached me to sign a petition. Um, today, I'd like to speak to you in opposition to speed humps on Walnut Avenue specifically. Walnut has a very different character than the other streets on this list. Um, it is a connector road and uh, it gets much more traffic volume than the other streets, which means much more noise. At the same time, it's also much denser uh, uh, re residential population. And so there's gonna be a lot more people adversely impacted by noisy trucks going over speed bumps, cars accelerating after speed humps, et cetera. Um, also, there was a um, study from the British Automobile Association that showed that speed humps cut fuel efficiency in half in blocks where they're installed and also increase NOx and SOx by about a third. So it's, it's actually quite bad for the environment compared to other traffic calming measures. Um, I, by the way, I'd like to mention here, I'm not opposed to traffic calming. I actually think there is a speeding problem on Walnut and I think traffic calming would be a very helpful thing to have. Um, I was hoping to show you a picture, but it looks like I can't share video. Um, but there's an intersection at 21st and Walnut, which is a natural chicane. Uh, and people cut across the center line and across the bike path all the time uh, in order to cut the, the curve and go faster. So instead of speed humps, uh, for very little money, you could install uh, some flexible dividers along the, the center line and get the same effect as a speed hump. It would significantly slow traffic down without having the adverse impact that, that speed humps have. Um, uh, Ryan also told me that um, it would be within budget to install a traffic circle instead of speed humps on Walnut. And I think this is really worth considering if we can do the same project in budget using a, a different set of means um, because I really think, I mean, based on the arguments Ryan brought up, um, there's actually a lot of arguments uh, against installing speed humps on Walnut in particular. Um, I'm very concerned about the safety impacts. If uh, there's additional ice buildup uh, and uh, it takes extra time to clear the snow on Walnut, um, it may be three speed humps instead of five, but that, all, that still means we need to tell people elsewhere in the city that their street didn't get plowed because we had speed humps that we had to clear very carefully and slowly. Um, I'll, I'll end here, but please, I'd like to ask uh, for more time to do a fully data-driven analysis uh, before we move forward on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. All right, up next is going to be Sue. Sue, I'm unmuting you now. Hi. Um, so I live on 29th and I did get the, I, I was not part of requesting the speed hump, but I did get the mailings just to let you know. But my comment is on Walnut Street and just more of a question of what happens in the bike lanes on Walnut Street where the speed hump is. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sue. Uh, maybe Ryan can respond to that next. Right. Yeah, so uh, Sue, the, the speed humps will be in the bike lane as well. They go from <coughs> they go from gutter pan to gutter pan. <coughs> thanks, Ryan. <coughs> okay, next up is going to be Lisa. I'm going to mute you now, Lisa. Um, good evening, Tab. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the NSMP tonight. Um, first, I just wanted to say um, I appreciate that this program exists and also really appreciate how it is um, backed with data and that there is a lot of analysis that goes into determining um, which streets are selected. Um, being uh, the, the top scoring street of, of Walnut Street, um, I hope that you will approve the, the speed mitigation that um, staff has been able to work out for Walnut Street. Um, I noticed that the data had the 85th percentile of speed, but I would be curious, given that we have 800 speeding vehicles per day, um, what the, the like 99th percentile is, because I know that we do have a lot of, a lot of cars that go 
very fast on Walnut. Um, so I'm hopeful that this will help um, increase safety for the, the very fast vehicles, particularly. Um, and then I did hear that there were some comments about potentially a stop sign at 23rd Street. Um, and I understand that that wouldn't be used for speed mitigation, but I would be curious if the city could consider that as part of the, the 23rd Street, Green Street, um, just since um, there are people walking and biking down 23rd Street um, following the Green Street route. And um, that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. All right, up next we have Kurt. Kurt, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you now. Hi, Kurt Nordbeck. I live at 777 Delwood Avenue and we received one of the first, if not the very first um, speed hump that was uh, created during the this latest phase of the NSMP project. And first of all, I just wanna say that I'm very appreciative of the of the whole program. Um, I, it has significantly improved speeding on our street. It, speeding is actually still a problem on Delwood, uh, which is why I guess there's a proposal for one further east, but um, it, the speed hump that we've gotten has significantly improved the situation. I want to respond quickly to a, a statement that an earlier speaker made about um, implying that asking for a speed hump a sort of uh, sort of asserts a possession over the street. And I, I would just like to push back very much on that. I, I feel like asking for your street to be safe and livable does not in any way uh, imply any kind of ownership of the street. Uh, so I, I just, I, I, I reject that assessment completely. Um, the last thing I wanna say, and this sort of relates to what an earlier speaker said about Walnut is that my experience is that the vertical displacement of speed humps is, is becoming less effective, especially as vehicles have gotten bigger and bigger. I feel like it's less effective on large vehicles than it is on small vehicles like sedans. It's, it's less effective on big trucks and SUVs and so on. And horizontal displacement as produced by a chicane or a traffic circle or something like that would be the opposite. It would have more effect on larger vehicles, which of course are more dangerous than on smaller vehicles. So I would just like all of us to think about whether as, as the vehicle mix has changed, whether we should reconsider the, the mitigation um, methods that we use. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks, Kurt. All right, Tila, that's all I'm seeing. I saw someone in the chat who maybe couldn't find Oh, her. thank you. Yeah, D Deborah. Um, OK, yeah, I'm going to actually go. I see Lynn raised, but I'm actually going to go to Deborah first because she did chime in. Let me find her real fast. Let's see. Um. Oh, here she is. Okay. All right, Deborah, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. See if you can do that. Hi, can you hear me? We hear you fine. Let me start your timer. Okay. My name is Deborah Yin. I live at 3016 9th Street on the block just north of Delwood. Um, if driving behavior is similar to Ninth Street, um, north and south of Delwood, then I am in full support of the speed humps for Delwood. Um, an observation and a recommendation I have is that the, the westerly bump proposed for Delwood, that perhaps it could be moved closer to the stop sign to encourage people to actually stop. Um, so that is one of the problems in both directions on Delwood as well as on Ninth Street. Um, it is my hope the intersection of Delwood and Ninth will be addressed holistically for speeding and non-compliance of the stop sign. Um, and hopefully you'll see my application for some engineering um, solutions for, for the poor driving behavior on Ninth Street. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Deborah. 
All right, next up we have Lynn. Lynn, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Oops, oh, where did you go? <laughs> uh, maybe you changed your mind, Lynn? If you do wanna, oh, there we go. Okay, Lynn, you should be good to go. Yeah, I was just trying to lower it since I was there. Okay, um, yeah, I really would have liked to have seen um, Ross's um, imagery for a shared screen. Um, and I think that obviously the tab would have valued from it too. I know there's no dialogue, I get it. There should be, um, that should be changed also. But um, my comments, I'm gonna reserve to, um, the more traffic that we're getting in town, the more that tab delays <coughs> on making a quantitative assessment of the impact of each human being added to the population, overloading our carrying capacity and jamming traffic impacts onto our streets, the more money we're gonna need and the more money we're already in deficit of and why are we in that situation? We need to be charging this not to the people that are living here in the neighborhoods and not wanting to have the impacts of traffic, but it needs to be imposed upon the, the, the developers that run this town. And the way that that can be dealt with is through a per capita traffic impact quantification for each development that happens. Just like they have, you know, 25% uh, affordable housing, that affordable housing goes far to get projects approved. And that affordable housing creates more, the need for more affordable housing. And it's an, a cycle of despair of growth and a cycle of despair of more and more traffic impacts and more and more speed humps and more and more of all these traffic mitigation devices and more and more dissatisfaction on the part of the community in, in having a nice quiet and peaceful existence. So please consider the bigger picture of what's going on here, which is lowering the demand for the traffic mitigations to start with. Done. Thank you, Lynn. That's all I see. Yeah, let me just do one quick check of the chat. Um, yeah, Ross, okay. sorry, we were just using the chat for technical issues about the meeting, but thank you. Yeah, I think we're all set, okay. Tina. Okay, all right, we will close this public hearing uh, and move to tab discussion. Um, and I will say, I'm gonna have my attention divided for a little bit here. And so I would like to uh, hand over chairing the meeting to Alex, our vice chair. Um, I will be listening. I'm going to turn on, I'll have my video on as, as available. I'm still at the meeting, but I think I won't be able to attend as closely as I would like to, to be able to properly chair the meeting. So I'm going to let Alex take over from here. If any TAB members have any thoughts before we entertain a motion? Alex, there was one of the projects, uh, and it's it's the one over by uh, Southern Hills, I think, uh, between Toadley and Knox. And there was some, it, it, it seems like there's different sets of data around that one. There's our data that comes from the staff uh, analysis. And then there was folks saying, geez, the only time there's speeding is around the school pickups uh sort of twice a day 
And that's also a you know, huge congestion issue. And therefore, is it really an NSMP? Is, is NSMP really going to solve that when it's a peaking problem? And I, I wanted to invite uh, Ryan or, or anyone else on the team to comment on that particular situation because my, my sense is that the yeah, NSMP is, is not necessarily going to solve a one-time congestion plus speeding peaking issue. Yeah, that's, you're right. So the NSMP is not going to necessarily solve the issues around pickup and drop off for, for Southern Hills or Fairview High. Um, that said, you know, we collected speed and volume data in 2019 as well as 2020, and there weren't significant differences, especially on the section where we are proposing the speed ump east of uh, Hastings. So the 85th percentile speed was within one mile an hour of the speed we collected in 2019. You know, and there's a number of things that could influence that difference. Um, I would say that we actually saw a higher 85th percentile speed um, on the western side between Hastings and Knox in uh, 2019 than we did last year. Um, so you know, but again, we looking at the data, we we felt like it was uh, okay and appropriate given the feedback we received to remove the speed up on that section from the proposal. So, so what you're saying is, when school was not in session, you were still seeing the issue. Correct. Got it. We also, you know, so I'd like to point out as well, you know, because uh, we did get that feedback from a number of residents and. Uh, so we have been working with Boulder Valley School District officials. We had a, an on-site meeting, I believe it was in fall of 2019, um, with our operations group. Uh, DK was there, myself, as well as uh, Landon from VVSD and a few other uh, folks, a few principals. And so uh, we, are, we are working on an initiative there to address some of those issues. Um, it was delayed because of COVID. So certainly we can... Um, reach out and try to jumpstart that process again. And, you know, I mean, it, we'd be happy to hold a neighborhood meeting to talk about some of those specific issues. But, um, you know, speeding is an issue that will be addressed with traffic calming devices. It's not gonna address other issues, and but other issues won't necessarily fix the speeding problem either. Got it, thanks, Ryan. Mark? Uh, I, I should have asked this question uh, earlier in the tab question and answers, but uh, first, before I go into any commentary, Ryan, what is the department's policy about using stop signs as a speed mitigation device? So we do not use stop signs for speed mitigation, traffic calming, we use them for traffic control. Um, we will install them in tandem or alongside a um, NSMP project if they're warranted. But again, you know, there are um, federal standards that we need to follow when we're installing stop signs because we don't want them to be ineffective and, um, you know, we don't want people ignoring them. Okay, thank you for reminding me of, of that. Um, I'm simply going to say that uh, <clears throat> I'm going to support uh, this particular slate of NSMP projects, and, and I do so for um, the reasons that uh, the more I, I, I learn and study our NSMP process, the more I realize that this is a neighbor initiated process, which doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's a neighbor initiated process. The barrier to entry is, is not uh, insignificant. You have to get out, you have to collect signatures from your neighbors. We have to do a traffic study, we have to do a speed study. And, and we've, we uh, collectively, TAB and staff have developed what I think is a good objective scoring criteria. And, um, uh, and I, I think it's, it's too bad that many times 
neighbors feel like these projects are sprung upon them. But you know, we we all have lives that uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult to find all the mail to open and and uh, how to respond to things. But I think the city, in general, uh, the department does, and Ryan in particular, does an excellent job of public outreach before we before uh, we make uh, a, a decision about which projects to move forward with. I also um, want to say that uh, in, in a little north of me, uh, we've installed on Quince, we've installed traffic calming, experimental, uh, temporary traffic calming devices on Quince, all of a horizontal nature rather than a vertical nature. And if you read the next door thread, on that, um, which I've responded to in, in, in a couple instances, but there's lots of, oh, gee, if you could only just put in some speed humps, wouldn't that be great? Um, so as soon as, uh, and then on the streets where we're proposing speed humps, then the response is, well, gee, can't we, uh, can't we do horizontal diversion? Um, so anyway, we're, we're kind of betwixt and between but in general, I, I just want to say that I think we've developed uh, a, a very good, it's not a perfect process, but a very good process that um, yields results. And, uh, and, and I, I am one that I, I really truly detest the idea that the street in front of my house is mine, uh, whether it's in parking or speeding or speed humps or whatever. Um, uh, and I advocate for community-wide solutions. And I, I think our NSMP program offers community-wide solutions. And yes, sure, traffic does get diverted at times, um, but people weigh that decision of whether to traverse a speed hump. And I, and I wanna emphasize speed humps are designed to be traversed at the, uh, at, at the maximum speed. And Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but a speed hump is designed to be comfortably traversed by most vehicles at 20 miles an hour. If, if, if the street speed maximum speed limit is 20 miles per hour, then the speed hump is designed so it can be uh, gone across at 20 miles an hour. Is that correct? Well, so we advise a speed of 15 miles an hour over speed humps, generally speaking. Um, you know, and, and the, the idea is with the 20 mile an hour speed limit to make sure that between humps, people aren't excessively speeding or getting above that 20 mile an hour mark. Um, right. You know, but I, I think uh, a good point that was brought up earlier, um, you know, it does, it, it, it does vary. I mean, there's not, depending on what you're driving, um, you know, yes. you may be able to drive over a speed up at 20 miles an hour, or you may not be able to. I drive a Honda Civic, and when I drive over them at 20 miles an hour, they're not comfortable, but when I drive over them at 16 or 17, they feel okay. So yeah. it just, it depends on the vehicle. It's not a one size fits right. all. Thing. Yeah. But we can't, we can't, we can't design a single immutable object for all vehicles. So we do our best. Anyway, um, I, I simply want to conclude with, uh, you know, we, we are confronted with uh, safety issues, uh, comfort issues, and um, and and this program, in in my eyes, does a a good job uh, for the greater good, and um, and and the improvements, even even a asphalt speed hump, uh, when when things change, uh, vehicles change, whatever, they're they're not immutable. We can we can. Uh, we can move, we can change, we can modify. And um, uh, I, I think that in general, I think the, uh, the, our NSMP uh, is responsive to neighbors and, um, and we need to carry forward because it does reach our goals. And finally, I will say that those that claim that, oh, we only have speeding during um, school, uh, school deliver you know, delivering children to school, well, gee, that would be the time that we would most want uh, to mitigate speed would be at those, at those peak hours. Uh, and that's certainly not a reason uh, to avoid speed mitigation uh, near schools. Thanks. 
Brian? I am very supportive of the program and I, and I support what Ryan and the staff are proposing in general here. Uh, I, I also want to just recognize and thank Ryan for this work uh, because I know that when you're getting right up and near people's houses, um, people have a tendency often to assume and, and project uh, personal ownership over that space around them, even though it's public right of way. Uh, this is a similar dynamic, I think, with parking, in which people have gotten used to a feeling that they have a a claim over something that the city has been spending money on in a certain way. Um, but it's the case, I think, in both of these uh, issues that we're learning there are really significant externalities to uh, the unmitigated subsidy of cars and just sort of, you know, let, letting them move as quickly as, as people might want them to. So it, it just, as I, as I listen to public comment, and I'm, you know, I, I'm very, um, I, I, I can really hear both you know, I, everybody's made a good point that I've heard, but it, it, I just sort of feel like this, this kind of, this is kind of a proxy, like perspectives on this tend to be a proxy from, do you want um, to eliminate the, the comforts and friction of, of um, or, or do you want us to stop the elimination of, of, uh, of putting things in the way of comfortable, frictionless motor vehicle travel? Or do you want to work towards an ecosystem that, that values more modes and uses besides the, the car and the, the personal truck or SUV? Um, and, and that's both with respect to helping other modes, cyclists and pedestrians, uh, be more encouraged to be out on the roads um, and also to be um, put a real premium on safety for, for kids, uh, for, for vulnerable users outside. Um, and of course, the city has multimodal goals. We're struggling to, to um, well, maybe that's too strong of a word, but um, we have work to do to um, achieve them. And so I think we, we really do need as, as a principle to focus on the second. Um, and it's reasonable to say, well, but at what cost? And I, I think what we've heard is you, whether it's maybe 20 miles an hour is not comfortable to drive over them. So 15 miles an hour is, 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 is more so, but that's not, a, I don't think that's a, a huge cost um, to do this. Um, and so on the question of data, there, this has come up a few times, I suppose I, I would be inclined to, to flip it around and say, we, we should be trying to calm the streets of vehicles in general. And the, the burden of not doing that is what should require data. Um, if there's a good reason not to, you know, let's talk about it, but um, that should be the burden. And it, I, I did hear the interesting suggestion that um, speed humps might displace traffic onto other, other uh, other streets, I'd, I'd be surprised if speed humps, it, may, maybe they will, but I suppose in that case, let's just, just increase the, the deployment of these speed humps and, and, redu and you know, calm, calm traffic um, throughout the neighborhoods where we have, or places where we have um, sensitive users um, and other modes. Um, so that's mostly what I, I have to say, although a, a final one thing uh, Mr. Nordback had said about um, the you know, using horizontal displacement to reflect the, you know, vehicles getting bigger and bigger. That seems like a great idea. It probably sounds like beyond the scope of, of this exercise, but that um, would welcome the, the chance for the city to, I don't know, consider options for, for that sort of thing going forward. Um, so, so good done, good job, and I, I support this. Thanks. If I could just um, respond to that last thing you said. Um, so we, we are, um, looking at trying to use horizontal uh, uh, deflection traffic calming devices in simple projects. The challenge with doing it is, uh, at least if you're not doing it, you could, you could certainly do it with paying posts, but it, to do like a capital project, hardscape, concrete thing, um, they, they're just more expensive than speed humps. And so generally speaking, we can only do one of them per a simple project. And so for a longer street, if we can only do one thing in the middle of a long street, it'll be effective in that very specific location, but not for the rest of the street. So I would say for simple projects going forward, using horizontal deflection, so curb extensions, chicanes, traffic circles, would be appropriate on shorter streets or streets where we have another reason why we cannot build a speed hump. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I too am leaning toward approving the uh, the proposed list. Um, we always underestimate, I think, how much interest you know, some of these projects get, and often there's one or two that flare up. And uh, I am mindful, as as Mark commented, that this is a wildly popular program, and people ask for it. Um, I am sensitive to uh, the critique that. Sometimes people don't hear about it early enough to, to weigh in um, and to register their dissent or feel that their dissent is being registered. Um, to those people who are listening tonight and who have written in um, and taken the time, I, I do want to assure you we read them and we consider them. And uh, on occasion, it's only happened really once that a project has been completely pulled. Um, because of dissent or, or disagreement among uh, the neighbors. Um, but as some of you uh, have written to Ryan about your concerns and he's discussed a little bit tonight about how some of these projects get changed or amended in response to some of the concerns. And so there are people who are um, uncomfortable with the initial proposal and I want to commend staff's flexibility and responsiveness to those critiques. Now to the larger critiques that we've been hearing um, in particular about the, the process, um, not just you know, that dissent isn't weighed um, and to the critique about it being an ownership uh, of, your, of your own block. Um, we really, when we were developing the criteria for this program, um, which is not perfect and I understand we will be revisiting that criteria before scoring the next round of, um, of, of applications. I think we talked about that earlier in the spring, Ryan. Um, I had always had a problem with it just being the people who live right there who were able to request it. I had thought that there was, particularly for streets near a school or a park that are more community resources, that there might be very valid uh, and invested people who would want to request um, safer streets and slower streets uh, near them who didn't necessarily live right there. And so that's uh, you know one thing I'm gonna ask us to look at again. Uh, but to the idea that uh, it needs to be a majority rule about what exactly gets put there. That's just not how do cities work. We have very talented and experienced and professional staff. And when these projects begin, they are a petition to the city government to say, we have a problem, please measure the problem, please weigh it um, along a set of criteria to determine is our problem bad enough to get fixed. And all of these projects are scored and weighed according to the same criteria that we have uh, as a group developed um, and will continue to think about and refine. But uh, that in part was meant to counteract some of the sort of gut reactions of people who say, well, I've lived here for 30 years and it's not that big of a deal. Um, we have measures in place um, to, to literally quantify how big a deal it is, how many people are breaking the rules by how much um, in order to, to remove some of the subjectivity of it. And so based on that, I'm really surprised that some of these streets scored the way that they did, but that's the data. And I trust Ryan and I trust our city staff and I believe in the data. And that is fundamentally the basis on which I am I am behind the staff recommendation. I continue to be disappointed that our only tool in the toolbox seems to be a speed hump. I do think that we are moving toward um, chicanes and some more creative ways um, to, to restrain speeds. But uh, I hear the critiques that we've gotten from the city. I think all of TAB has been reading and aware of uh, the dissenting voices. And I just wanted to make sure you know we're not ignoring you. We just don't agree uh, on the, the balance um, of what the transparency and the, um, and the data for the backing up these projects, I think speaks for itself and I'm going to support um, the proposals. Thanks, Tila. I think you addressing the, the methodology was really important. It's something that TAB has had the ability to help the city staff refine over the years we don't have the projects before us and that gives me some confidence in it. Two projects that I think are worthy of extra attention are Ludlow, where it sounds like Ryan has addressed some of the concerns that were brought forward and the lengthy uh, engagement we heard from and all read uh, from the neighbors there. And I find that the recommended approach is a good compromise based on the feedback that was received and addresses a need that is present outside of school rush hour 
and then Walnut, which is an interesting street, especially given how many speeding vehicles per day. I appreciate the um, ideas that were brought forward. I think in there, the roadway is a little constrained and staff's approach uh, with the three stop sign or the three speed bumps and the consideration of a stop sign at 23rd are, are what we can do with the, the current tools we have. As always, I appreciate the public input on this. This is one of the, the things we hear uh, the most about throughout the year, even those descending. Um, one concern of mine is that I think this last cycle, 80% of applicants qualified for speed mitigation, which means we're on our way to be in the speed bump capital of the world, which I don't think is the best thing. Uh, but, uh, and in the last year, we or in, the, in a, Span of a year, we're going to spend about a half million dollars on 10 of these projects. The consulting fees and the data collection, the complex projects really um, drive the cost up of this program overall. So thinking citywide, if we end up with 80% of our streets qualifying, it feels like there's there's no end in sight. And that makes me somewhat nervous considering 80% uh, of our crashes happen on our arterials. And this program is mostly just to make our safest streets uh, marginally safer. So I, I worry that we could probably use our overall dollars a little better, especially when arterial streets qualify for grant funding. And these are mostly out of pocket expenditures. Uh, but based on all the feedback we've received and this obligation, I think the city has to the people who've taken the time uh, to submit applications for these projects and weighing the each of these proposed projects on the merits that TAB has had input on over the past year and years prior, I'll, I'll end up supporting the slate of projects as recommended by staff. Um, if there's nothing else, we can. Thomas, turn could I chime in one with one one more quick thing because I, I I should have brought it up when I was speaking earlier. Of course. Um, Tila's comment reminded me. Um, there, there's certainly a tendency for, you know, some streets to be more activist than others. And I, I do worry about, uh, is there a mechanism for less engaged, maybe, uh, I hate to use the word, but less privileged streets or ones where folks don't know of these mechanisms. Is there an equity dimension on this, that that uh, when we're thinking about this program down the road, not tonight, uh, we can think about if there's a, if if there's a construct uh, around it uh, that can that can uh, add to the mix streets where where people simply don't understand this mechanism and how they might produce more safety for themselves. And I've brought up before the potential for linking that to schools and. Uh, areas where there's schools. So that's more a comment than uh, than anything around this slate. I certainly support this slate. Thanks, Hedge. And a question for staff. I think in the past we voted on these all as a group and last year I believe we did them one by one. Uh, do you need them done one by one or would it be possible if a motion was brought forward with the entire slate that we could vote on them all at once? I believe you can vote on them all at once, um, unless you were going to recommend we don't move forward with one, and then I think you'd want to, or more, then you'd call it out. Okay. Does anyone object to voting on these all as one group? I don't see any objection to that. Would anyone like to bring forward a motion? I'd like to move we approve the... Is it seven? Mm -hmm. And yes. it's MP simple projects presented to us this evening for installation. I'll second. second. Oh. Any discussion? All those in favor? Let's see, five votes in favor. Thanks to all the members of the public who turned out for this. Uh, we do read all of the input we received from you and feel free to keep in touch with us after implementation of these projects to let us know uh, how, they're, how they're working. And with that, we'll move to 
the next briefing agenda item six, which is the state highway 119 bikeway conceptual alignment options. I believe we are joined by some members from the county to help support that. And I see DK just unmuted as well. Just to introduce our colleagues from the county. Take it away. Excellent. And Stacy, is um, Alexandra Phillips joining us this evening? Here, I think, as well. Yes. Oh, there she is. Good. Well, a good evening, Tab, and um, I would just like to uh, introduce this item tonight. Uh, this is about the exciting 119 bikeway project. Uh, the city of Boulder has been, uh, staff has been coordinating with Boulder County on some conceptual alignment options here, and we have some guests. We have Stacy Proctor, project manager for Boulder County, and also um, bike planner Alexandra Phillips. And so with that, I will um, turn it over to Stacy to um, offer you a short presentation. Great, thanks, DK. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. There we go. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate um, you guys taking the time to hear from us and provide your input. I know it's been a long, a long agenda, a lot of discussion already, so I appreciate you um, sticking with us here. Um, the purpose of our uh, presentation tonight is to give an update on the Colorado Highway 119 bikeway project, um, the design, and um, get your input in particular on the um, conceptual alignment options that we have for the south terminus at the boulder end of the project. And um, just a reminder, this is an informational um, presentation only and the no, no, no decisions are requested. As the Boulder County project team, I'm uh, again, Stacy Proctor, I'm the project manager for the county. And then Alexandra Phillips, who's also here tonight is our public engagement lead and also the county's bike planner. And then we also have Tanya Luber on our team and she's uh, the regional trails planner for the county. And then of course, we're working very closely with um, all of our coordinating agency and, and agency partners, including the city of Boulder, city of Longmont, and then also RTD, CDOT, and commuting solutions. Um, and then just our consultant team, we have a, a few folks I wanted to just mention. Moeller is our main design um, engineering consultant. And then we're also working with Class A and CDR Associates for um, outreach and engagement. Um, in terms of kind of project background, I don't know how familiar everyone is um, on this. I wanted to just spend a few minutes of kind of how we got to where we are with the bikeway, um, the 119 bikeway. So back in 2014, when RTD did the Northwest Area Mobility Study, it was um, a separated bike facility was identified as a recommendation as part of that, um, that study. And then um, uh, RTD also did a PEL and it was a little bit further refined, the idea of a, a bikeway between Boulder and Longmont. And then in 2019, CDOT did a conceptual study that, um, that conceptual design for the bikeway. And then since that time, Boulder County has kind of taken over. Um, we've received a grant to do the design. And so we're right now in the process of doing the concept plan review and refinement based on what CDOT had. So um, we're finding that um, based on additional data, including environmental data, land survey information that we've received and public input. Um, so we're in that process now, um, and then hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be moving into preliminary design and then final design. This project is one of the counties, or the 119 corridor is one of the county's top priority mobility projects. It, right now we're estimating that the construction cost for the bikeway would be between 30 and $35 million. Uh, we don't currently have any funding for construction, but we are actively pursuing um, construction funding and working with all of our partners to, to figure out how to get it paid for. Um, and hopefully by the time we're ready to build it, we'll have money to move forward. This is just a high, high level overview of our schedule. The main thing I wanted to just point out is that we're kind of at this beginning phase here of um, stakeholder engagement and that we'll have additional rounds of engagement 
um, as we move through the process. But this is kind of our first um, opportunity to really hear from uh, the community and, and other stakeholders about what um, what they think about how we're moving forward. This um, shows the con conceptual alignment with some potential alternative alignments that we're looking at um, on the north and south end, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more um, in detail. Um, one thing I wanted to point out here, as you can see um, at uh, State Highway 52, if you, there's not enough, there's not a median there right now, but um, that CDOT is looking at um, adjusting that intersection to be consistent with the other intersections along um, 119. And so based on that assumption, they're moving forward with that direction. We've moved the alignment to, to stay in the median throughout the whole corridor. So basically that the idea is that the bikeway would be within the median um, between Boulder and Longmont. And then we have some, some options on how to get outside of that median on both the north and south end that we're looking at. One of the things that um, we've been really trying to emphasize with this project is that we really see this as the bikeway um, on 119 and it's really filling a gap. Um, City of Boulder has a lot of great bicycle facilities. City of Longmont has a lot of bicycle facilities. And so really, if we can complete the 119 bikeway, people will be able to get from downtown Longmont to downtown Boulder and vice versa, and the communities in between um, on a separate bike bicycle facility. So our, um, our goals and vision for the bikeway is for it to be safe, direct, accessible, and comfortable. Um, you can see kind of below how we're defining that. Um, so with safety, we're looking at great separated crossings at high volume um, intersections and enhanced, cro enhanced crossings at, um, at the other intersections that we have, um, looking at lighting, um, safe conflict zones, those kinds of things from a safety perspective. Direct, um, you know, we're really looking at something that's going to make this um, a, an appealing commuter path. So something that's not meandering and circuitous, but something that's really um, direct as much as possible and minimize the length, um, have great separations. So there's not a lot of waiting at lights, those kinds of things. Um, we want it to be accessible and something that all user types um, will feel comfortable using. We also want to make sure we have connections to the trails, to the future bus rapid transit that CDOT is working on and have um, really good first and final mile connections. And then comfort, um, we're looking at a, a little bit wider path than the standard bike facility. Um, we want to accommodate e-bikes. We want to look at um, year-round maintenance, so plowing in the winter so that um, people can use it regardless of the weather. Um, so I kind of mentioned this before, the just typical section concepts that we're looking at. So as a standard width bike path is generally 10 feet. We're proposing a 12 foot um, width for this path. And then looking for the high activity areas. So these would be areas um, adjacent to transit stops, um, underpasses, um, other crossings, just areas where there might be a higher volume of, of track it, traffic and then in particular uh, pedestrians. We're kind of looking at two different options, either a, um, a, a bikeway facility and then more of a casual zone for pedestrians and maybe slower cyclists, um, or similar to what um, is at the on Broadway near CU, having a, a, a bike lane in each direction and then a separate lane for pedestrians. So those are some options that we're looking at and, and interested to hear your thoughts on, um, on those options. This is the um, north end connection alternative. So I'll share these with you just so you're um, aware and, and interested to hear your input as well, but um, at the Longmont side of things. So there's three different alignment options that we're looking at right now. So the red is what was in the concept design that CDOT completed. Um, so basically that it would, um, you, we would cross under after um, or north of Fordham Street and then connect into the existing um, multi-use path along the, um, that north side of the, of the road, um, northwest, I guess. And then um, 
alternate options or the blue option where we would cross under uh, the southbound lane on um, uh, south of airport and then um, connect again into the multi-use path that um, is in Longmont. Um, and then the third option that we're looking at is the um, gold alignment where we basically continue in the median all the way up to the underpass that's there near Oscar Blues. So those are kind of the options we're looking at. The, the green dotted lines are potential future connections to the Lobo Trail. That's something that we've heard from people and really would help with the connection to some of the neighborhoods on the east side of Longmont. And then the options that we're looking at at the south end, um, the we're really looking at basically two options. So there's the red, which was the, again, the conceptual alignment where we would um, connect near the Pleasant View soccer fields and then go under 47. There's kind of, there's already a, a bridge there and it looks like we can kind of regrade and could just um, pass under the existing bridge. And then um, an underpass to get, uh, well, you'd have to cross Four Mile, Four Mile Canyon Creek and then um, an underpass to get into the median there. And then the alternate, what we really started looking at after this um, new development went in and the multi-use path that was built there, we thought there might be an opportunity to, to use that facility. And so we're, the alternate um, alignment that we're looking at would be connecting to that facility that's been built and either crossing Four Mile Canyon Creek or potentially um, using the wide shoulder on 119 to cross the creek to avoid another crossing and floodplain impact. So we're looking at that and have a meeting in a couple of weeks with both City of Boulder and City of Longmont floodplain staff to kind of get their input on these options because the red alignment is City of Boulder um, floodplain jurisdiction and the blue alignment is Boulder County. So. Um, kind of get input from both of those um, folks on that. So this one, the um, our consultant has kind of been recommending the blue alignment, but um, we're still looking for input. So um, that's not written in stone, but that's sort of where their recommendation is. And primarily, I think the big thing for that is just really, it, it really helps connect more into the southern um, the southern part of Boulder. Uh, so with 47th and the future protected bike lane or multi-use path that's planned um, or that's in your plans, um, we could connect into the foothills path and just a lot of connections from there. So really thinking that that people will be able to go south and west from, from that blue alignment if, if that's which way we go. But um, there's obviously pros and cons to both of them and, and we're weighing those and wanna hear, hear what people think about those options. And then lastly, I did, I did wanna give a little bit of more information about there's a lot happening with 119 and we're all coordinating closely together and you guys I'm sure have heard about the um, what City of Boulder is doing with the 28th Street Business Access Transit Lanes project. Longmont has their Kaufman Street and Hoover intersection project. Um, and then we also have a lot happening within the 119 corridor. So we're working really closely with CDOT and RTD to make sure that the bikeway alignment works with whatever highway improvements CDOT works on um, with the new BRT um, park and rides. Um, and, and transit facilities. So we, we're meeting regularly with them and, and coordinating to make sure that those designs integrate. And then we're also working on what we're calling a touch once approach. So as we move towards construction that it, you know, CDOT's working on there, State Highway 52 um, intersection that can we build the underpass for the bikeway at the same time, rather than um, having to come back and do that later. So we're, we're coordinating on that and hoping timing and funding stars align <laughs> to make sure that that happens as we move forward. Um, so th this is our project website. Um, happy to, you can sign up for information. We have a survey out right now. It would be great to hear from the um, community in Boulder what you think. So um, I would love for people to take the survey, um, give comments, ask questions, um, those kinds of things. My contact information is on the website as well. I realized I didn't put it up here. So. Um, you can find my name and contact information on our website. 
and then yeah i'm happy to answer any questions um just a couple of prompts for that just are there any clarifying more questions or on this or background and then do you have any um uh comments on the preferred alignment option for the um bolder end of the bikeway um and also just happy to hear other other comments that you might have so thank you thanks stacy yeah uh, first any questions uh we'll start with tila Thanks. Stacy. can you back up a couple of slides and go to the slide with the south alignment option? Yes, there you go. That one. So I'm a little confused because there's an existing underpass that's not shown on here that I, I don't know how it would tie in or not tie in or be useful. But between, you can see where the four mile creek path comes and crosses, yeah. And so there's an underpass just right under your arrow there that's existing right now. It goes under the highway. And it goes under the highway. This way, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's not marked here, but yeah, it goes under both of these. Or yeah, um, yeah, just, yeah. I, um, yeah, it'd be helpful to make sure we add that on there. But why would that not be useful for maybe tying in some of these options? Um, yeah, I think because we're, yeah, it's kind of a tight place there and I, we want to go the other way, right? Like, so the underpass here is getting us under the highway, mm -hmm. um, but then we also have to get over the creek. So I think those are kind of the two things. So he, um, yeah. So I, yeah. So here, like, if, if I'm sorry, I'm not totally clear, here, <laughs> but um, so if if we went with the not with the red alignment with the blue alignment, people could access it from Fort Mill Canyon Creek, the yep. path here. Yeah. Or they could come from the south here. Right. It. Or they could um they can, yeah. Or you could even kind of I know people kind of come from uh iris and go along here and then kind of through this parking lot to this multi-use path over here. So yeah. Those oh, are so you're saying the okay. So the existing underpass just kind of stays south of the creek. Yeah, it stays south of the creek. Okay, and so that's why we would still need to. Yeah, figure and it something. doesn't okay. get us into the median, which is a little bit hard right. to see here, right? So we still have to get into the median. So it's, right, it's kind of and then complicated. and then the red alignment shown there would require a bridge over that creek area. Yeah, bridge over the creek and then an underpass down here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, any feedback on the alignment on the boulder end of things, cross section, or other general thoughts? Mark? Um, yeah, I, I'm. Uh, in terms of this this southern end of it, I, I prefer the, the red alignment that's been being discussed because of the direct nature of it. Uh, and I, I spent a, a lot of time riding recreationally through this area. And um, I can say that the, uh, the dashed black alignment would be particularly uncomfortable along, along the highway. I, I, that is not one that I think would be of interest to uh, many cyclists. And um, uh, so anyway, I like the red alignment and uh, appreciate that. As, I, as I've reviewed this project, the only other thing I, um, I was glad to see in your set of slides that uh, direct is a, is a uh, being direct and being efficient is a, is a, is a criteria. And, um, and safety is a criteria. And to both those things, uh, there are way more underpasses along this, this route than, I, than I, I start trying to add up underpasses in the county. And I don't know what that number is, but I can tell you it's, it's less than in the city. And the city has a lot of experiences with, with underpasses. And, and my experience as a cyclist with the city's underpasses is they are poorly drained and they are dangerous in the winter. And um, I would uh, suggest that there is a, a lot to be learned from uh, 
city underpasses in the winter uh, that uh, are, are exceptionally dangerous at the entry and exit points uh, for commuting cyclists that are focused on getting to work, uh, focused on getting to work on a cold, snowy day that the previous day was warm. So um, whether it's ride-alongs with our, our excellent uh, snow plowing crew, because I, I don't fault our, our snow plowing crew with anything. They, they do a great job clearing snow and doing it uh, well. And I think there's a, a, there's a lot to be learned from them. Um, but the drainage, whether it's uh, from overhead, from railroad tracks or roads above, whether it's from hillsides draining down and uh, into an underpass, um, there's just a myriad conditions that provide for really um, uh, uh, crash uh, inducing uh, uh, situations in, in our underpasses. And again, I, I love them, you know, 70, 80% of the time of the year uh, because they do make uh, a cyclist feel more comfortable uh, and avoid uh, many uh, stoplights, et cetera. But anyway, I think there's a lot that the county can learn from the city's uh, both experience and, and designs that, uh, that could, could be improved upon. I would urge you to really take advantage of uh, our 60 some underpasses within the city limits to uh, see what you would like to avoid doing. Okay, yeah, that is, that's great advice. I appreciate that. We definitely, um, I think drainage is going to be a challenge for sure, and we've already identified that, so any advice will be <laughs> appreciated. Um, I also wanted to just mention that the, the dash black line is um, an ex existing bike lane, so it's not under consideration as one of yeah. the alignments, so it's just the red or the blue, but I, I, I hear what you're saying about the red, so. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, so Stacy, this is Hutch. I'm I'm mildly in favor of the blue under the scenario that we actually know what happens when we hit 47th, uh, and that's because of a conception which may not in any way be borne out by data that a considerable portion of the cyclists will want to continue uh, down what becomes foothills as opposed to go across Iris. Mm -hmm. uh, because of where you know employment and housing and everything else uh, might might be that these people might be coming from, uh, if they're coming from North Boulder, they'd come across that other path. So I'm I'm not. I, I just think it's it's useful to really think about the connectivity into the complex of bike paths on either side of foothills, uh, going south. And right now it feels like we go like, oops, we're done. Uh, and I, I know there's ideas about 47th, et cetera. So that, that, would, that would determine my choice. But if I felt good about those, I'd be biased toward the blue. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Hutch. Ryan, did you have your hand up? I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry, um, I was pretty sold on what Mark was saying, and I was going to ask you, Stacey, to, to if there was a counterpoint because I wasn't sure if I heard a, a strong recommendation either way. But I think I think maybe Touch just offered it, and it reminds me that um, I've talked to parents who are coming from east the east side, um, taking kids to school, and we're in school season now with the with the BBSD trying to encourage people to do things other than drive your car. So. I don't know if there's a, a, a good way to ask BBSD parents if they have preferences, but I think they'd be a big, big customer here on folks who would be who'd be using that in and out. I could be wrong. Maybe it's too small of a number, but um, anyway, just a procedural thought. Yeah, that's something we can look into. I don't know how many people are going to schools that way, but we could definitely check it, check into that. Kayla. Thanks. So um, I slightly prefer the red alignment, I have to say. Um, and partly it's because it does, it feels more direct to me. Um, I think that the point is, is well taken that the blue alignments 
um, at the finish point with 47th or so gets you a little bit closer to the beginning of or the top of the foothills path. Um, I think for the connections to the Wonderland Creek path, it's hardly better. And in any event, uh, at 47th Street seems fairly direct, but I couldn't tell from here whether, I mean, it looks like um, the red alignment doesn't really meet up well with 47th Street. So I, I, I second Hutch's comment, like I have to know how, how that happens. So if I can't get onto 47th Street with that future protected bike lane or multi-use path, then it's not a terribly good um, connector. But if there was a way to get onto 47th, then I would probably prefer as just a, as a commuting cyclist um, to be using foothills and then take 47th and connect to that red alignment. It just feels more direct. You're not weaving around a neighborhood. Um, and uh, as far as the dashed blue line goes, when I saw that and realized where it was going be going against traffic, that's all um, northbound, fairly high speed uh, motor vehicles at that point to be sharing um, a, a shoulder going the wrong direction toward them struck me as nightmarish. So yeah. I was strongly yeah, discouraged definitely. Yeah. that. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. And I see Alexandra um, who with her hand up. So I go ahead, Alexandra, if you have. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to um, chime in because you're all really pinpointing exactly the issue. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The um, concept plan originally, you know, the red line, we quickly realized that that was a very awkward connection to the foothills path, but doing the blue line to the black to 47th, um, the whole, the, what we're thinking is that it would be a slight, even though you, it wouldn't be as direct as the red line if you're going westbound into the city, that it's an easier connection to make, um, but that is that's something to really think about. What you know? How do you make that? We have to. If we're picking one or the other, how do we make both those connections work? Because we will have people going in both directions, and your comments have just really highlighted that it's um, the the trade offs here. So thank you. This has been very helpful. I just want to chime that in. The other thing I, I wanted to mention too that we didn't talk about was um, I think part of part of why we were sort of looking at the blue alignment as well was some of the um, was on Iris the um, that the path that's a one direction only on the on one side and so um, and then crossing the crossing Iris was a, a bit complicated so. Um, that might be something else just to consider that if we are looking at the red alignment, how can, are there things we can do to make that connection on the iris if people are trying to um, somehow go, go that direction in Boulder um, that can make that a little bit easier. So that was something else we were looking at. Again, I think that speaks to why we have some cyclists in this area using 47th street is because that iris, you know, it's, it's a, it's a divider and uh, notwithstanding the um, the crash that happened last month at this location, um, it is a safer feeling option than trying to cross Iris without the help of a um, of a of a signal. Um, so, as a daily commuting cyclist, I would probably choose 47th Street if I was trying to connect to the Foothills Path and to to either of these alignments, um, and not really use that tail end of the Iris. And I'd always been confused at, uh, with that northern leg of the, um, of the Iris bike path. Like it was a bike path coming from nowhere. And I remember we did a, um, a bike ride. It was one of the CIP bike tours like four or five years ago. And I was like, where are those cyclists supposed to be coming from? Because it seemed like no one would ever come that way. So again, the red alignment is kind of delivering what we had, we had planned, but that's a fair question to ask. Is this a good plan for them? I think for, for directness, I still prefer it. Yeah, okay, yeah. great, yeah, thank you, yeah. I'd be curious if we could get a little bit of the best of both by going with the red alignment and then additionally a multi-use path that runs from the diagonal crossing, maybe the intersection of Independence and 47th uh, and parallels 47th Street down to the foothills, um, I guess it's the Wonderland Creek bike path. Um, are you seeing my arrow? <laughs> yeah. Like this, is that what you're saying right there? 
No, uh, from the intersection of Independence and 47th. Oh, okay, here. Right there, and then just paralleling 47th Street to the south. Oh, to the south, I see, yeah. So yeah. no bridges or underpasses involved, maybe a railroad crossing that'd be difficult. Um, but having walked around this area a bit, checking out some of the sites of the fatal crashes that have happened recently, I was amazed at how disconnected the diagonal crossing was from neighborhoods nearby if you're on foot with 47th Street having limited crossings and only a sidewalk on one side of the street and being a narrow sidewalk at that. So if we could fit in a multi-use path there, it could provide some connectivity options for those biking between mm -hmm. destinations on the diagonal in Boulder and also probably facilitate some turning movements within Boulder, people making movements from traveling along the diagonal and then maybe also trying to access Iris. And so we, I think we get a lot of the benefit and directness with the red alignment, but could um, provide some other connectivity options and improve the uh, ped bike access at diagonal crossing in the process if we did a parallel multi-use path as well. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I know we were kind of looking at, this is a private property. So we were kind of looking at like, who owns that? And could, could that be something we, we look at? Um, could it be on the west side of the street though? That be seat out property. On this, um, I think this is City of Boulder, right? This road, forty seventh. Yeah. So I don't. Yeah, we. I don't think we looked at that side of the road. I think we, when we were looking at it, Alexander, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we were looking more on this little triangle here that you were talking about. Okay, I think West would be just as good, and maybe even align with the existing multi-use paths in that area as well. Yeah. Um, but the the railroad crossing and getting a perpendicular crossing of that railroad could be tricky for many reasons. Yeah, okay. Any other tab feedback or questions? If I could just jump in a little bit on, we were talking about how to connect the red alignment to 47th Street because there's a vertical separation there. And it seems yeah. to me no worse than the, the same kind of hill you have to climb on the Foothills Path at Pearl Street, for instance. It's not great but it's you know you have to do it to get over the railroad again and it's not the kind of hill that's going to deter a daily commuter um you know we already deal with with stuff like that and it's just you know one of the one one of one portion of the ride but it's it's i don't think it's going to be so formidable as to discourage a, a huge portion of, of the intended users of this path if we manage to connect it yeah and alexander do you remember i'm trying to remember exactly what that area looks like because I feel like there is a path that goes up near there but I can't remember how that all looks but I think that's a great idea because I, I kind of just goes through the parking lot you get diverted through the parking lot there yeah but I, feel, I thought mm -hmm. there was kind of a path that goes up okay. somewhere so, um, Stacey there's not a path today okay right there that connects and the underpass is an existing underpass over the 119 right. Right there, and so they would util be utilizing, or actually 47, right. they'd be utilizing the existing underpass in that case. Yeah, right, yeah. Being able to fit in um, a multi-use path in, in that section. And then the grade uh, from, from the highway to the existing path is pretty minimal. Okay, yeah. Uh, Stacey I, and I, oh. I had an unrelated question because uh, in my head and maybe in others' heads, this is essentially a highway for bikes. Uh, but I know at least in some of the conversations you guys have been having, uh, and certainly in some of the design decisions, there, there's, there's a thought that people somewhere will be walking on this thing. And that for me was a consideration in thinking about the blue option because there are a fair, no fair number of people living right there uh, in, in that, uh, new housing development uh, who may actually want to walk a little further uh, in a different direction. And so that, that's, that, that was actually part of my logic, uh, trying to trade off the bicycles who want to go directly and fast, at least some of them do, uh, with those other usages. Thanks, yeah. Taylor, your hands up. Oh, okay. Ryan? 
Yeah, so, sorry to belabor this, but maybe to save some time, um, I, I, I asked a question about BVSD and I just did a little more thinking and, and a little research here. And just, just maybe to better articulate it, I, I, I suppose um, the question is, what are the open enrollment schools um, and, and how might they be affected just probabilistically? So I think you've got BCSIS, High Peaks, Community Montessori, University Hill. Those tend to be more in the, in the South-ish. Um, and I know that some of this because I've been talking with um, Amy Thompson from the district of, on some of the, their TDM work. But in any case, um, I guess maybe just to answer the question, so there's not, I'm not suggesting a follow up, that does tend to be more in the South ish. So um, I'm not saying you have to go with the blue. I sort of like Mark's ideas about, about the red, that it's, that it's flatter. But um, I don't know if there's anything else to do on that with just, just considering um, uh, what it looks like to move, to move this along with, with possibly small kids, you know, families traveling, that sort of a thing. It might be worthwhile, but otherwise, I'd. I'm, I'm good on this. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, that's. I thanks for the clarification. And yeah, thinking about the schools that have high open enrollment is a is a good good thing to look at. Anything else from Tab? All right. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, Stacey thank you. And team from the yeah, county. Thank thanks for having us, and ho hope that we'll be back um, sometime next year. Either <laughs> have us back again, and we can talk about. When we get to the preliminary design. Awesome. Thanks, Deb. All right. Next, we have agenda item seven, which is a DCS update from Garrett Slater. Garrett, I see your screen, but cannot hear you. All right. I just had to find the mute button, which moves when you uh, start sharing your screen. Okay. All right, so hopefully at this point you see the full screen and not the presenter view. Okay, so again, <clears throat> for the record, my name is Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer, and I'm here to provide an update on where we are at with the phase two effort for the design and construction standards and Boulder Revised Code update. So uh, recognizing that some of you all are new to um, the design and construction standards, a bit of a background here. So the DCS, as it is known, it was created uh, a number of years ago. Um, 1998 was the, the most recent sort of comprehensive update. And then it went through some additional updates in 2000. And then there were subsequent updates that happened in 2019 for both transportation, transportation and utilities. And in 2019, some of you might recall those updates were focused on providing additional guidance for pedestrian curb ramps or ADA ramps, we sometimes refer to them as, as well as bike lane width standards to bring the DCS in alignment with the, uh, at that time, um, I should, if my slides don't advance, please uh, give me a, a reminder. Um, thank you, Natalie. So uh, the, uh, the, 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 at that time, we focused the, the effort narrowly, and it was, again, to uh, bring consistency between the low-stress walk and bike network and the design of construction, construction standards. And um, so the, the design of construction standards are used to inform and guide and provide basic standards for how we implement transportation infrastructure and the public right-of-way for both capital improvement projects that are funded by the city, as well as for private development projects that happen via real estate and community development. So it's a document that is used by us in capital projects in the transportation and mobility department, as well as by the development review team and the uh, planning and development services department as well as engineers that are doing work for both of those departments, as well as for engineers that are working with private developers. And so at this point in time, we have identified a need for continued guidance and enhanced guidance to accommodate newer design treatments. And further that we would like to align our streetscaping and landscaping standards and details with uh, our current practices inside of the DCS. So the purpose of the phase two update that we're here to uh, uh, present tonight is to update portions of 
the, the, the standards that align with industry best practices for um, safety, mobility, sustainability, and quality. And also to, uh, it's, I would note it's a, a larger step uh, or task in a, excuse me, it's a, a, a singular step in a larger process of updating the overall DCS. So we have received community feedback from TAB and community cycles and other interested stakeholders over the, the, the years that uh, the DCS should receive an update and various forms and that uh, a number of the sections should be um, given uh, additional attention and treatment. So we are focused in the, um, in the space to update and specific areas, which I'll get to in just a moment. And so uh, if you're wondering why we are presenting this to you, I wanted to uh, note the purpose of TAB and the DCS and that the, the role of TAB is to review proposed changes uh, as they apply to the implementation of the transportation master plan and capital projects. So that is the, the purview under which uh, we're, we're here with you um, this evening and throughout the process uh, is that it, it's your role to make sure that this, this DCS uh, is applicable uh, and, and it is consistent with the TMP as they uh, implement the capital project side of things. So the specific sections that we're here to, uh, to to, to, to work on as a part of the phase two update include section 2.07. Uh, and this is focused on our basic roadway geometry and uh, roadway. Uh, and, and, and when I say roadway, that also would in entail not just vehicular, but uh, roadway geometry as it relates to all users of the street. So cyclists, pedestrians, and transit vehicles and a couple of uh, salient sections inside 2.07 that we would be paying attention to would include corner and intersection radii and lane widths. And so uh, lane, lane widths as they uh, relate to um, vehicle uh, lanes, uh, as well as uh, how those would interact at uh, intersections and so forth. And then uh, the other component of this, uh, as I noted, will include updates to the landscaping and streetscaping standards, which would entail updates to uh, tree buffers, irrigation um, standards, and recommended plantings. And so whatever comes out of uh, the section updates to 2.07 and chapter three and 10 would be updated also with chapter 11, which is where the standard drawings for all of the individual chapters are located. So within the street geometric design, I noted uh, that some salient points that we would look at would include lane widths and uh, intersection radii. This is the complete summary of the topics that would be addressed with their, a comprehensive review of the street ge geometric design and some of the tables that we'll be visiting uh, as, as we look at uh, areas that we can update the DCS. And an example of how this might be used on a public capital improvement project is that we are about to embark on the preliminary and final design of the 30th Street Separated Bike Lanes Project between Colorado and Arapaho. And the, the DCS, the phase one update uh, that we went through in 2019 does provide guidance for standard bike lanes, buffered bike lanes, and separated bike lanes. But the, uh, there, the thought is that some of these standards that we are exploring as part of the phase two update would uh, be useful uh, as we're working on the 30th Street bike lane project. That's not to say that we don't have the ability to go um, uh, and seek a variance from the current minimum standards and, and implement something else. We certainly have that as an option, but uh, it would inform uh, the, um, uh, that the DCS would be able to inform the 30th Street project as well as other similar type projects in the future without having to go through that variance process. And then on private development projects, uh, perhaps uh, uh, an example that comes to mind would be the Junction Place project, which is between Pearl Parkway and Prairie, uh, adjacent to the REV development. So just south of uh, um, Boulder Junction area uh, and the, the, the Depot Square. So. It's, uh, that street is actually not open to the public yet. We recently constructed a bridge in partnership with the, the adjacent developer there. 
and that uh, is going to be open to, uh, to vehicular as well as pedestrian and cycling traffic. We expect in the next month it should be open. But uh, that was uh, a private development project that relied upon the DCS for how it was constructed. Now, uh, over on the, the landscaping side of things, so both chapter three and chapter 10, as I noted, focus on plantings and irrigation and streetscaping standards. And uh, some example of how this would be applicable is you might recall that the diagonal reconstruction project between 28th Street and Foothills included um, several hundred plantings of shrubs and trees and, and also encompassed a pretty significant irrigation system. And so some of that is going to be a, a bit of a challenge for our maintenance uh, side of the department to be able to keep up with. Uh, it was uh, really great from a sustainability and that um, uh, obviously plantings are good for the, 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 the climate and the environment, but uh, if we aren't able to take care of them, then they're not going to be able to serve their, their highest and best purpose. And so we need to make sure we've got standards in place that ensure the viability of our, our maintenance side to be able to take care of them. And so the, the best practices that have come forward through the recent transportation landscape plan, as well as some other green infrastructure plans will be incorporated into the DCS to make sure that um, we are we're built, uh, implementing plantings that we can take care of. Um, you've probably seen places around town where the plantings have not done well and places where they have done well. And so we just wanna make sure that the investment we're providing up front on our landscaping and our softscape and streetscape that we're able to preserve that investment and enhance the, uh, the, the quality of the experience of being along our transportation facilities. So, um, uh, and then also, uh, I would also note that there's uh, some obsolete standards that are in the DCS that we want to make sure we're addressing. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with the, uh, the issue of the Emerald Ash Borer, where the Parks Department is routinely going around and taking down uh, ash borers because they've, uh, or uh, emerald trees because, or excuse me, emerald ash trees because of the borer problem. And so um, th those are no longer uh, trees that we're implementing. And so um, that's an example of also the kind of the detail that would be sorted out through this effort. And then finally, um, the effort will include some update of the Section 997 of the Boulder Revised Code, including site triangles. And, and this is a, an exhibit that comes straight from the BRC. Uh, figure 9-8 shows what a site triangle at intersection of streets would look like. So uh, as a, a parallel effort with this DCS update, we'll be revisiting what site triangles should look like, like at these intersections. So the timeline of the project looks like this. We have gone through project scoping and consultant selection, and we are um, now currently in the process of researching, researching and developing initial recommendations for the DCS. And then when we uh, uh, see you next on the DCS matter, we'll uh, be uh, in January or February of 22, we'll be coming back to um, provide initial recommended revisions for the sections that we noted here on 207 and the landscaping and streetscaping standards. And then the plan is that by spring, we'll be moving into uh, final draft 90% revisions to bring to the boards. So there are other boards that we'll be bringing this to, uh, aside from TAB, that would include the planning board. And then um, in late spring, we'll be looking to bring this to city council for approval with uh, a summertime publishing and updating and staff being trained on the updates. So the immediate next steps, as I noted, is we're going to be going through making recommendations on what the 60% level of revision should look like. And then from a public engagement perspective, we are going to be garnering feedback via the Be Heard Boulder questionnaire and finalizing that inventory of revisions and then revisiting this matter with TAB in January uh, to get the feedback on those draft revisions. And so the questions we've got for you tonight are uh, what questions might you have about your role in the project, the overall process, or about the community engagement for the, the project. So happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Karen. Um, since we're a little behind schedule, I'm uh, curious if we could just go through these uh, person by person and address all three questions at once. Would anyone like to go first? Do 
Sheila. Thanks. Uh, Garrett, is there a phase three? There will this be a phase three that okay. it's uh, currently it's not scoped and we don't have a definitive timeline for it. We'll get okay. to, to phase three when we have uh, more clarity around the, uh, the the staffing and resourcing and budget to work on that. Okay, because, you know, the various agitators that you mentioned, uh, you know, that were spurring this 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 look, which is very welcome, uh, the revision pro project. Um, we're very interested in, in parking standards and <laughs> revisions. Um, which isn't part of this. I think though the one thing that I was uh, trying to make sure we do cover was with the sight lines revision um, was as far as I recall from going through the DCS, um, it doesn't really contemplate uh, our some some common street geometry here where there's a multi-use path that's separated from the roadway. Um, and from what I can recall of, of really looking at the sight lines when um, the Lucky's now Whole Foods development went in was that our, our site triangles didn't um, envision that there would be a, um, a multi-use path before the curb, you know, the sort of back of curb treatment that we're trying to, to get um, more frequently in town and that that would be um, a, a very big missing section or section that needs to be kind of revised and paid attention to with this revision. So I guess I just wanted to highlight that. Right, and so as part of the BRC 997 uh, review, that will be an area of focus. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I forget what your questions were, but oh, do we have questions about the process and outreach and? Uh, yeah, I think that's so covered it, my it questions. Help, it would help if I <laughs> the, the, the slide. <laughs> yeah, and Tab's role in this project. I think we're, I, I think I'm good. Anyone else? Alex, I have something, but I'd rather you go first if, you, if you'd if you be willing, because I think you'll have much smarter questions and ask them better than I would if I was getting close to them. But I don't want to put you on the spot, so your call. I don't know a whole lot. I was I had the same curiosity that you had about my subsequent phase. Brian, do you mind meeting yourself? Sorry, can you say that again, Alex? Do you mind meeting yourself? Thanks, I was getting some feedback, at least on my end. I mostly had the curiosity that Tila had about subsequent phases, I think, with our traffic studies and potentially looking at some site planning stuff. There's a lot of opportunity for more collaboration between TAB and the planning board um, when it comes to parking um, and traffic studies, especially that will require uh, revising some chapters that are included in this scope, but understand that it's, you're not asking what we think should be in the scope now because that's dependent on many things that are out of all of our control. Alex, I did have, I did have one, should I, shall I go now? Or we, okay. So Garrett, um, question, I just, I guess I have this maybe new two or three topics. I'm just wondering if are covered under, under, I'm trying to follow the, the dialogue, but um, I guess the first question is, so these are just sort of like, like topic areas on um, application of slip lanes and, and causing a terrain in which uh, families and whoever on bikes need to do a three-phase crossing across the island pork chops. Is that, is that the domain of, of, of DCS here? And, and if so, is that something that might get treated in, in this, um, this update? Like, you know, whether and when to create that kind of a geometry? So that item specifically is not a part of 2.07. I can go back so you can see the sections of 2.07, what that would entail. And what this shows here in terms of the tables and the topics is that uh, right turn bypass lanes and slip lanes would not specifically be addressed. But uh, I would say some of the content that's included in this focus area could indirectly inform what a uh, uh, that a slip lane might look like. Okay, and you're not looking for feedback on whether those, you know, more, should more directly that item should more directly be be covered because you've already we've already got through that part of the the process. Is that right? Uh, so no, we haven't uh, got through that. The uh, I would say that that's probably uh, some of what we would be looking at here. So for example, at intersections. Uh, 
I'm getting feedback. I don't know if that's me or uh, the, uh, the 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 corner radii, for example, um, could potentially uh, identify how that might have an influence or an impact on what um, uh, right turn bypass islands look like um, and uh, how they would be treated. Uh, but uh, I, I would also say that um, you know, that's an area that we could look at as a part of a future phase for um, updating what they would uh, look like um, or, or whether, you know, uh, where they would be most appropriately used uh, in the city's system. So um, I, I guess to answer your question specifically, Ryan, no, we're not looking at, at those uh, as a part of this phase two effort, but I would say what we do here would inform what they would look like in future phases. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thanks for that. Then I guess I just just count count me as as somebody who'd be interested in in taking that one up. You know, this is one of those places where this wonderful network and multi use paths you know runs into the boulevards and arterials and creates all kinds of issues for people on bikes. So um, uh, so I anyway so that um and then I guess I'll try to be quick. The other one is um, I'm guessing the answer to this is no, but on on the question of of level of service and and may, and maybe relaxing the um. I guess needs for for level of service as a metric and level of service study and as as a as something that can slow down or um, I, I just get, get in the way of of doing more protected bike lanes is is that something that either could be taken up in this or if not now in the future and either way please take take my support for um, taking that on right so I would say that would also be a, a focus area for a future phase we have the consultant tool design uh, with a, a set scope of work that we're focused on right now. Uh, and they have uh, uh, the, 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 the budget we've got and the staffing we've got is about all we can uh, um, take a bite of uh, for the, the present. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Mark, do you have your hand up? Oh, yes, I do. Go ahead. Um, so uh, I appreciate Garrett uh, asking the question, it, uh, what are our questions about TAB's role in this project? Because I, I find this to be a, a great example of the tension. And when I say tension, I don't mean it in a pejorative or a, a negative context, but a, a tension between uh, a citizen advisory board that happens to have people on it like Alex that can uh, muscle their way through a, 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 a DCS and people like me that, you know, I'm a, uh, gee, I'm, a, I'm an engineer in my dreams, but in real life, I'm, I'm not. And um, uh, so as I studied the chapters that we are uh, discussing today, uh, I began at the beginning and each chapter begins with intent. Uh, so uh, section uh, on the uh, streetscape design 3.01a intent. Um, and so I, I read the current intent and I think that with any uh, design construction, any manual, um, it's obvious that it's good practice to begin with what is the intent of the subsequent chapter. And in this case, I read the intent and I thought that really doesn't capture what I consider uh, the TMP uh, goals uh, are climate crisis goals uh, as, as, a, as a good statement of intent. Um, so I, I wrote what I thought might be uh, a, a pass at, at, at the intent. And I'm happy to share it. I can click on send and send it to everyone as an email. I can share my screen. But the point I'm making is that I think an excellent role for TAB in providing input uh, to changes to the DCS would be to check uh, our intent and what our stated intent is in each chapter, whether it's in uh, landscaping design, whether it's in uh, uh, specific corner radii, um, whether whatever chapter it is, uh, I think it would be worthy of us to 
go back and look at the intent statement in each of those chapters and decide, does that, um, does that intent guide the subsequent uh, standards that, are, that we impose upon um, the rest of the community as we redesign streets and intersections and build buildings and create multi-use paths? So anyway, I, I think that's an area where um, our collective uh, smarts and intelligence and our collective input and guidance from the TMP could be an excellent guide for the rest of uh, uh, staff and, and our consultants and everyone else that if we, if we begin with a beginning that we can all agree upon uh, that represents our, our goals and desires and intent, then we'll have a better product on the outcome. I can't help but remember the words of our uh, former tab chair, Bill Riggler, who said, always start with why. Right, there you go, good. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think I'll click on send and uh, send this note. Um, so I, I've done my explanation, but anyway, I, I think it's a, it's a challenge that we ought to, ought to take on. So that's, that's my comment. Thanks, Mark. Anyone have anything else on this before we turn to matters? Cool. Um, let me pull up the agenda. So start with matters from staff. Do we have a regional transportation update from Jean? Don't see Jean here. Are there any other uh, matters from staff? Jean, Jean is here. Um, I think she was kind of coming in and out, but I think she's here right now. I see her. She looks like she's yeah. trying to figure out how to unmute. Yeah, unmute. <laughs> she just right. got her co-host and I think she hopped back on and we didn't get her co-hosted. So Jean, let us know okay. if you can unmute. Oh, there you go. There you go. Thank you, Jenny. I, and I'm Jenny, Jenny I'm just gonna say, Erica also can't unmute herself. At, right ah, now. let me yeah. grab her as well. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Jenny. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, great. I am um, going to share my screen. Give me just a minute. Let's see. All right. Okay, um, so tonight I'm excited to share with you something that has become a policy priority at the state level, um, as well as the local level. This is a priority, a statewide um, policy priority that our city council is taking on. Um, what's happening is that CDOT is proposing a new standard to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, um, improve air quality and reduce smog and provide better travel options. So what they're doing is very much in alignment with what our local transportation master plan goals are. So this new standard would require CDOT and the state's five metropolitan planning organizations, which would include Dr. Cog, of which we are a part, to determine the total GHG emissions expected from future transportation projects and take steps to ensure that greenhouse gas or GHG emission levels do not exceed um, set GHG reduction amounts. So essentially, um, our statewide and regional plans would have GHG budgets by which they would meet. Um, a little bit of context as to how we got here. If you recall, back in 2019, um, we passed House Bill 1261 to reduce greenhouse gas pollution and establish statewide GHG reduction goals. And those were probably the most um, aggressive goals that we have seen come out of a state. Um, looking at 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reductions of, of 50% um, by 2030 and 90% by 2050 from 2005 levels. So with those targets in mind, um, the state released their GHG 
Pollution Reduction Roadmap um, back in 2019. And essentially what that roadmap did was establish the pathways or the policies that we would need to enact and the regulations we would need to enact to meet those climate targets. And it included more than just transportation. So for example, it included things like um, oil and gas development, electricity generation, fuel use in homes, um, business and industrial applications, et cetera. Um, but with transportation being the largest greenhouse gas um, contributor, um, we're taking aggressive steps now to target transportation. So um, following that 2019 roadmap in 2021, Senate Bill 260, if you recall, um, we had discussed this um, earlier this year, that was the state transportation funding bill. But in addition to the $5 billion in new transportation funding, there were also requirements laid out for CDOT um, and MPOs to establish these GHG budgets. So essentially that is what the Colorado Department of Transportation is currently doing and they are in that rulemaking process. So getting back to the roadmap, we might ask the question, well, what does this mean in terms of how much GHG we need to reduce? So the goal is to reduce um, pollution by 12.7 million metric tons by 2030, all from the transportation sector. And that's gonna be achieved in various ways. So we expect 6 million metric tons to come from, or a reduction of that, to come from low and zero emission vehicle rules. So those would be the state's ZEV rules that require a certain percentage of new vehicles to, uh, new vehicle sales to be low and zero emission. Approximately 2 million metric tons to come from utility and public investment in fleet turnover and infrastructure. So imagine charging stations and such. Um, and then 4.7 million is going to come from a variety of different sources. And you'll see that in red, I've highlighted the GHG pollution standard for transportation plans, which is the focus of this rulemaking. But in addition to that, there are also policies that will be coming forward related to incentivizing land uses or smart land uses to reduce vehicle mile travel, clean trucking strategies, um, things like um, indirect source rules so that um, if you develop something that's going to increase VMT substantially, you mitigate that and expansion of public transit, including um, setting the stage for front range rail. But, but really this rule specifically that's in front of us um, over the next month or so is related to this GHG pollution standard from transport for transportation plans. So I don't expect you to, <laughs> to read the details of this table, but essentially what it's showing us are the baseline projections of all of the transportation master plans of the five MPOs currently. So for instance, um, Dr. Cog has a 2050 regional transportation plan. So it's showing us those baseline projections and then next to it, how much would have to be reduced to meet these goals. So you'll see that for Dr. Cog on the front, on the, the front row or the, or the top row, and then um, CDOT and non-MPO areas in the bottom, bottom with total. So essentially, again, not to belabor these numbers per se, but there are targets that are being set. And so the question is, how will we meet those targets? Um, the idea being that we will use statewide forecasting, travel forecasting, um, and Dr. Cog more localized forecasting to establish those budgets and ensure that our regional transportation plan and TIP projects meet those budgets. If we don't meet those budgets, there are a number of mitigation measures um, that are proposed to offset those emissions. And this is just a sampling of those mitigation measures. These are sort of a first cut at what these could look like. So more transit, more bike ped access, more mixed use, what they're calling vertical development, first and final mile access to transit, changes to parking and other policies, which has been a big point of discussion amongst TAB, um, and more electric charging. And so the idea being that these mitigate, mitigation measures will be more fleshed out at the Dr. Cog level in the coming months um, once these rules are adopted. Um, so essentially, like I said, these, um, I think this is, um, oh, sorry, I, what I wanted to show you again, 
you've seen the slide, essentially that this was the funding package from the Senate Bill 260 transportation funding bill. So the way I like to look at these new um, GHG budget rules for transportation plans is that, you know, the first part of Senate Bill 260 was funding the types of transportation that we need to see to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this is more of the, the stick part of it, if you will. So what can we do from a regulatory standpoint to reduce GHG emissions and primarily looking, looking at reductions in vehicle miles traveled? through our regional transportation plan. Um, and so right now we are in the public comment period or CDOT is in the public comment period of the rulemaking process that will um, end on October 15th. And we are working with um, our elected officials, our Dr. Cog board representative, representatives and organizations of which the city is a part such as um, Colorado Communities for, um, uh, for Climate Action, CC4CA and others to comment on the rules and um, as well as providing support to our um, members of the Northwest Area MCC to provide comment on these rules. So um, I just, I know this is a lot of information in a quick um, period of time, but I would encourage you to um, participate in some of the public hearings that will be scheduled um, over the coming weeks. They will be virtual and I can share those dates with you all. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Any questions for Jean on this? Seeing none, we can move to other matters from staff. Hearing none, we can move to- No, I'm here, sorry. I was having okay. a little trouble getting back on. Hey, good evening, staff. I just have a, a quick update for you for the Share Micro Mobility Program. Um, as you know, um, the city uh, went into a contract with Lime to provide e-scooters and, uh, and B-Cycle to provide um, bike share. And currently there are 200 e-scooters that are deployed in East Boulder. And in terms of bikes, we have currently 100 e-bikes and 200 pedal, traditionally pedal bikes um, uh, citywide right now. And, uh, and so, you know, we are very much in the learning phase with, re with respect to the e-scooter program. You know, we're starting to get some comments. Uh, we received quite a bit, so has council. And as a result, uh, council has asked us to um, attend the September 28th uh, city council meeting to provide them an update on both e-bikes and e-scooters. And so we just wanted to be, you know, make sure that you guys were aware um, of that upcoming meeting. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask or answer. Thank you. Thanks, DK. I'm curious if you have any data on the scooters yet, even something as simple as trips per vehicle per day. Yeah, we're seeing about 2.5 uh, trips per vehicle per day on the scooters. And they needed to exceed two for the fleet to be considered successful and have the opportunity for growth. Is that correct? That is correct. As long as they can achieve their uh, KPIs, their key performance indicators and some of those things we're looking at right now. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mark? Have we had um, any reported accidents yet? Any, uh, any Anyone tripping over a scooter on a sidewalk, anything that uh, worthy of note? We haven't had any reported um, uh, crashes yet, uh, you know, in terms of a crash going through the police department and ambulance being called. We have learned um, of one crash, um, but it was not serious enough to be reported to the police. Other than that, we haven't heard anything about people tripping over e-scooters um, or anything of that nature as of, as of yet. We're hearing, hearing most about um, um, e-scooters that are misparked in the public right of way. So potentially blocking a sidewalk or a multi-use path. That's been kind of the common uh, concern that we've been hearing. Um, and would you characterize the vendor as saying uh, that they, you know, is this going as well as they had hoped or expected as far as the vendor's uh, perception of this, uh, of this project? I, I would say so. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that they've also been very responsive to a lot of our requests and 
they're quick to um, find solutions to issues. And so they're, you know, working with customers um, within the community and then again, very responsive to staff. So I think that they think it's going pretty well, especially in terms of the numbers that they um, are seeing in terms of the rented scooters. Great, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm just wondering if um, we should have a TAB member at that September 28th meeting. Would you rather that not happen? It, I mean, it's kind of our dumb idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> if they want to be complaining about stuff, I feel like we should be there to, to absorb some of that. <laughs> So um, I guess what I wanted to say is that this is a special meeting, you know, that they've called. Normally, it's a study session on night. And um, at CAC, they had asked for it to be matters from staff. And I'm really not clear under the matters from staff uh, or from the, or from the uh, city manager how engagement takes place as opposed to, you know, if it's an item for consideration. Okay, well, let us know if we can be of any help. Certainly. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Any other tab comments or questions regarding shared micro mobility? Awesome. Thanks, DK. Thank you, Alex. Any further matters from staff? Okay. Uh, open board comment. I'll start with, um, I think. Back to East Arapa, I think a lot of the things I'm bringing forward uh, warrant some tab involvement. And uh, I will try to meet with staff as soon as I can to further discuss some of the things that I've brought up to them at the last moment here. I would welcome another tab member join me if interested and would be happy to plan around an additional tab member's schedule if someone else is, is interested in joining me for any of that. Is there anyone? I can join you, Alex. Okay, I'd appreciate that. I think what I'm proposing what could cut low six figures from the cost of the project, which is why I find it worth pursuing, but that that's also not an insignificant change to what has been presented to this board. So in the interest of transparency, I wanna keep tab up to date with conversations I'm having with, with staff. Um, a couple of questions on my end. I, there was mention of the David Adamson email regarding his DCS comments and the, his hopes for the wound earth. I didn't receive that email. Did anybody else not receive that? I did receive it, but it came in kind of late. It came in after the start of our meeting. Okay. I received cool. David Adamson's email regarding the wound earth, but not I didn't receive, Alex, I didn't receive anything from you at any point today. Ah. Oh, yes, I misspoke because I didn't realize that Alex sent it only to I only me, CC Natalie, Bella. Erica. Okay. So it wasn't CC to all of TAP. Okay. But if we could look into the David Adams, Adamson, if staff receives something, I'm not seeing anything regarding the winner or the DCS. And I, uh, yeah, we can look into that. I didn't receive anything either, but we can. Yeah, I, didn't. I got one at 611 and then he resent this something at 622 this evening is when I got it. Hi, that was. Hi, that was sent to me and, and Tila and Mark McIntyre and Kurt Nordback. Um, uh -huh. If you'd like, I could forward it to the entire tab or is that appropriate or. Yeah, yeah. why don't. I, I just went ahead and sent it. Oh, okay, okay great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. I, I cleared a, it up. <laughs> I have a question about the Vision Zero Community Partnership. I was appointed to be TAPS representative for that moving forward, but haven't heard any. I think I missed the first meeting and haven't heard anything about a next meeting. Is there another meeting coming up anytime soon? Hi, again. Uh, yes, there is. It'll be um, end of October, early November time frame is what we're looking at right now. And Boulder County will be hosting that next meeting. Okay. Just want to make sure that I'm getting invites in advance. Of make those. sure that you're included, Alex. Okay. Thank you. 
other matters from the board? Tila? There's the draft rules of procedure that I sent out earlier this week, or it's Monday, so last week. Last week. Um, so Natalie and Erica and I have been, we've had a few meetings about it and uh, it's gone through. I've also had a couple of meetings with Janet um, Michaels with the city attorney's office. And so uh, I just presented that for you guys to look through. I wasn't expecting to have any serious substantive discussion tonight. If anything jumps out at you, um, let me know, but I think we should probably put it on the agenda for a future meeting. Um, unless you want to just let it sit until our next retreat. <laughs> I don't know. But I just wanted to, just, to make sure you got it and whether you had any comments on whether we had a plan going forward for revising it or discussing it. Sheila, can I, can I drop two seeds on this? <laughs> I do, we just go a month you know, at a time, so I figured mine as well. Um, thanks for doing this and you, to you and the team. I guess two things jump out to me. Um, one is, okay, so this is about procedure. And um, I, I would love for us to have a way to more, uh, in a more organized way, enter written material into the minutes. So we have Mark sending out emails just now that he's evidently queued up for this process and it sort of is in the minutes, but I'm not sure if that'll be reflected, how that gets reflected. So, so something to allow us to, to be able to do that in a more organized, recognized way so we have an evidentiary record. This seems like a big challenge we have. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, maybe that's easy, maybe it's not easy to, fix, uh, to resolve. Um, the other one is, and this is a little more conceptual, but um, I'm just thinking, you know, reading through the document, there's 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 a quite a bit of drawing lines around uh, tab with, with tab can and and should not and should not do we vis-a-vis -vis staff, um, but it, it makes which which is fine and a, a good idea I suppose, but um, it it also makes me think, you know, t tab reports to city council and to city manager, and it, and I wonder vice versa, are there any obligations that we would would expect of staff um, that that should be codified here. I don't have anything particular to mention, but we, we do have a duty here and we need to be able to work with staff. So that's that's more of, I guess, the seed. The person's a seedling, this is more of a seed. Um, I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, we did sort of at the last, Natalie and I at, the, at our last substantive meeting on this talked about like, oh, well, should this be like an agreement between staff and TAB? And uh, that hadn't really been the direction that we had been working on it from i suppose and there were a few in earlier iterations there were a few sentences that might be misconstrued as uh, as tab being able to impose uh expectations on staff and those got those got taken out <laughs> um so it is very one-sided um partly because that's uh we were working off of a draft that got drafted 20 years ago um it, from the city attorney's office that never got adopted and it was sort of just you know that one-sided thing and i know that natalie had was aware of other more sort of reciprocal arrangements i think from from different boards or different contexts um, but we couldn't really find a good example of that to work from and so this is sort of deliberately one-sided um because we're strictly advisory right we don't have um authority over staff and to the extent there were things like talking about the information packet uh, instead of saying the secretary shall prepare, it went to very passive voice. It was like, it's, you know, typically seven days before there will be a packet of materials prepared and distributed by the secretary, um, just to take away some of that operative directive language. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, read, read it for what it is. And this might be something that, that becomes, you know, unpalatable and we don't, we don't proceed with it. That's okay too. Um, but on that point, and then in terms of getting materials into the records, I think that for most of the boards and, and uh, commissions, your that's why you have a separate email account. All of your emails are public record. Um, but there there is an attempt here to say when we have you know done um, direct questions about an agenda item before an upcoming meeting and haven't gotten answers back, or there you know there's an, an out of meeting like written dialogue between staff. We did put in, or we attempted to put in here in, in the draft that I gave you, a, um, a provision that said those, those things will also be appended to um, the minutes and put into the record with the minutes of the meeting to which they pertain. Um, so a little bit better than we have been doing when it's pretty direct. So, but you know, in practice, can we manage it? We're trying, it's new.
Um, first, I'm confessing that uh, I haven't really reviewed the document, Tila. So thank you for all your hard work. I really haven't checked it out. Um, secondly, I, I want to say I support Ryan's um, uh, efforts to I think I think we've had real improvements in our minutes, and I want to thank Meredith for that, and uh, and the rest of staff. I think that that is uh, uh, I, I feel so much better about the record of our meetings, and I think the record of our meetings as an advisory board, since the record is what we advise, um, not what we do or direct someone to do or whatever else, it's what we advise. I think is, is very important. So I would like to see an expansion of, of that ability to provide uh, things in the record or, or an understanding of, of how we go about that. And so I think that's an important aspect of it. Uh, and that's an aspect that, uh, that the board controls is what we advise. We can't control what staff does. We can't control what citizens do. We can control what we do, and so if we advise something, then having a uh, having a clear procedure for making our advice known is, uh, I think, a uh, beneficial to everyone to have that have that relationship. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I I look forward to further clarification of that. I'll read your document, um, but I think that that uh, additional methods. Oh, I know what, what the last thing was. Tila, uh, and, and you may have misspoke, or if you haven't, then I, I just really want to understand this. I do not have a separate tab email address, nor is it my understanding that all of my emails are somehow public record. Um, now, if I send an email to tab, I understand to the tab email address or to the, to the tab board members, uh, five of them, whatever, I would certainly expect that that would be part of the public record. Um, if I send an email to you or to Ryan uh, singularly, if someone wants to correct me, that is not necessarily part of the public record. Is that correct? What, what are people's thoughts on that? I believe that if you're discussing tab business, it is. That's my understanding also. And so occasionally I'll have people send something, a personal email to my tab email and I'll just take it offline. I'll respond to them from my other email account and say, don't use that one. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what that's for. <laughs> um, and so I, I know you have your, you, the same email account. I'm not, I'm not saying that by using the same email account, all of your personal emails suddenly become pu public record. But my understanding is that all of you, the emails that deal with tab business and the business that you do for and on behalf of tab using that email address, those emails probably are public record. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Erica, did you have something else you'd like to say about this? Oh, um, just very briefly, I, I think that what um, we've tried to do is to enter into a spirit of collaboration and partnership and um, shared benefit and support for the community in achieving the goals of our transportation master plan and our community's uh, transportation and mobility goals. And I would say, at least from my standpoint, that's very important because um, I think it's that spirit of um, collaboration and being able to work together and trying to make sure that there's a strong foundation there that builds the trust so that um, we're able to serve the community writ large and between all of us. And um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to each and every one of you for your thoughtful consideration um, you know, of this matter. And I look forward to having you know, additional um, conversation you know, with the board um, in the future. Let's do we all. Any else on this topic or other matters from the board? I'm just wondering, should we be planning ahead to, to schedule a, a more formal discussion about this, about the rules of procedure? And if so, should it happen super soon or 
I mean, you've waited months for it anyway. <laughs> uh, Maybe we can talk about the keeping... agenda setting meeting. I don't know. Yeah, try to find a, a lighter month. Okay. In the near future, I think before the retreat would be preferable. Although I have not read it in great detail either. Brian. I have something on a different topic. If we're, are we, are we clear? Are we cleared on this one? Okay. Um, so great. So this is, um, this is the part of the month where I have a little sandbox. So I try to be brief because I know it's late and uh, there's not a lot of my, my space left, but um, I had two, two topics. One is a, they're both questions for staff. So hopefully the right staff's here and there's enough, um, uh, enough left. <laughs> um, and, and forgive me for not knowing all of this a little better at this point, but I had an experience that um, recently that led me to, uh, re re well, working to report um, an incident involving a, a, a vehicle on a bike crash to the police department, lo local police, the city's police department. And it, and it got me just to thinking about um, the chain of sort of, ev not evidence, but um, just data and like what, what happens, like how does, how does an incident become data through the, through the police department that's a crash, not a fatality, but just, you know, a crash and on division zero team. And I, I'd be very grateful if, for just like kind of a quick explainer on, um, for, for example, does, is there a proactive way in which the, the transportation planning, maybe division zero team is actively soliciting from the police department? Hey, have you heard anything about bikes or, or does the city or not just bikes, but I guess, you know, any vulnerable users, or does, does, does the police department naturally like tag anything like that at all and that comes in? Um, and I'm just curious as just kind of both a user and somebody who's trying to consume the data and, and understand how all that sort of works. Um, Ryan, I was just going to say, it might be helpful maybe to have a conversation like offline with Devin or Mark Schisler about the, the, day. the process. <laughs> yeah, because um, Fine. <laughs> I mean, I I could try to summarize that, but I, I don't think it would be super productive right now, Fine. but they would be able to give you the detailed um, process of how we receive that data from the police department. But we work very closely with them okay. and it does get okay. categorized into a database. Yeah. Okay, I'll start there and then come back. If, if there's any, thank, thanks for that, Natalie. That's, yeah, that's pretty no good. Um, okay, and then, then the other top. Oh, go ahead. I, was gonna say, I think one of the most important things for um, tab board to know is that whenever there is a very serious accident or a fatality, um, you know, that is traffic related, I have been sharing that in the moment as I get that information with the tab chair and vice chair. And so that we can agendize it yeah. for future um, meeting. Erica, that makes sense and is pretty intuitive. And I guess I'll just offer like part, part of the spirit of me asking about this now is, is being somebody who like a lot of folks here are on the roads on a bike a lot. I, you know, it, 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 it's, it's clear that a lot goes underreported. I mean, from the user standpoint, and then, and then a lot of what happens is not necessarily a serious accident, but there's a lot of data that show there's, you know, close calls, there's a bike that gets crunched or whatever. And I guess I'm just wondering if, you know, how that sort of, if that there's a proactive way that that gets collected. But in any case, I'll, I'll make a daytime appointment to, um, to go over that one <laughs> a little more. So thank you. Um, and, th and then the other question um, was, so um, I, I mentioned Pearl specifically, the, the you know, the, uh, crossing the foothill, um, foothill path in Pearl. I'm uh, doing this, this every day with, with kids and seeing a lot of parents out there and seeing the BVSD um, system to try to encourage parents with the trip tracker and all that stuff, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to say for the record, maybe I already said it, but I'm incredibly concerned about that intersection as a place that is a main thoroughfare for, for bikes to be crossing um, across two pork shops and you know people coming off the motors coming off the um, the, the highway there. Um, but I guess my more general thought is, um, uh, is there do we have is there a process through which we're as a city asking specifically uh, BVSD families or parents about what like hotspots they're, they're experiencing in, in the general way as, as we ask them to consider modes beyond cars. Um, is there anything we're doing directly to survey that? And the answer, it's fine if it's no, but I, I'm just curious what, if anything, we're doing to actually survey parents um, or if maybe there's a gap for somebody and maybe it's not necessarily in the city, but um, just to kind of understand that sense of like, do are we hearing and asking parents like maybe to get to like a top 10 list or something of hotspots? So I would say off the top of my head, I don't know. 
and we can go back and you know at least ask the question internally. Tila seems to know. I, I was waiting to see if Liv was going to hop in. Um, I, I don't think it's a regular practice with most of the schools, but I do know that as part of like the safe routes to schools outreach to particular schools that she has been involved um, in gathering parent, like they have maps of the area. This is how they did it at Whittier. I'm assuming this is how you do it generally. Liv, you wanted to say what you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, Tila. Um, yes, so overall, um, BVSD does do parent surveys to ask about transportation experiences. I don't know how regularly those have been administered, particularly recently with, you know, with COVID and everything. Um, what Teal is referring to is a, a recent grant that we did with three specific schools, elementary schools, um, where we did that very specific outreach, um, not only with the parent surveys, but we went in person and we brought some maps and we said, tell us how you get to school and what your pain points are. And um, from that, we were able to develop some suggested infrastructure improvements, some of which we've been able to implement or will be through a Safe Routes to School infrastructure grant which is exactly how this is supposed to work, right? Um, and then others were smaller changes that we were able to make like adding signs where they were missing and things like that. So, um, but it would be good to check in with BVSD. We coordinate with them regularly. And um, so I can see if there are um, uh, more specific plans moving forward. Okay, thanks for that. Alex, that was it for my questions, but I had one more comment. I, I forgot to say this, um, if, if I could just real fast. So, so separate topic, third and final comment. Um, I, I wanted to just um, weigh in on the topic Lynn raised uh, earlier, Sigal, about, about videos, about video, um, showing people's video. And um, I haven't given input on this. I know some of this has been considered, um, and I, I don't know what's behind the fact that we don't have videos, but I, if there's not a really serious reason to not allow people to show their video while they're making comments, I really prefer that we do we do and there's a few reasons uh one is equity and access and you know as i think most of us know the majority of what people communicate is nonverbal. um and some people might really feel more comfortable like communicating that way or be able to convey their, their meaning better visually um and as somebody who myself has dialed into council um or city council um i can spend several hours preparing for two minutes um and, and really making a case it's a big deal. It can be a big deal for people to come on there, um, something they can remember for a very long time. Um, and I think just giving some honor to that is something we should we should strive to do. Um, and I think also it makes for ultimately a better community experience if people can see see one another. I mean, not just for the staff, the people on this side of the desk, but really for all of the participants. So um, anyway, there's probably a lot of reasons why it works the currently way it does, but I just want to voice my support for exploring ways to allow people to, to see them when they're making public comment, if, if, if it's foreseeable without a big cost. That's it for me for tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Anything else from Tab? Okay, we can turn to future agenda topics. I'm seeing next month, uh, briefing regarding safe streets, Boulder report update, and a essentially a DCS update. Although is that not, I mean that's not what we heard earlier. We're looking at the long term. That, three months that's calendar. outdated. That's okay. outdated. We won't be back with DCS next month. Okay. And then on this outdated calendar, not much in November, and then public hearing on complex and SMP projects in December, as well as uh, draft East Boulder sub community plan. And then on our agenda for this month as future agenda topics are two things that Mark has asked us to take uh, to look at the Broadway and Rayleigh lessons learned and the Clay Fong presentation. I believe those are things that staff would need to bring forward are those things that we plan on scheduling for an upcoming meeting. So we're looking into availability right now. Okay. Cool, perhaps we can discuss that further and then the um, draft procedural tab um, stuff at our upcoming agenda setting meeting. Any other future agenda topics that staff wants us to be aware of or tab would like to bring forward? So based off of last year, um, you know, that there would be the 
the letter from TAB, you know, to council, but we don't have a specific date or framing of it yet. Okay. Is that usually early in the year is when that gets sent off? I think last year it was like you know, November, December ish time. Okay. And yeah, I think it was due in December. Okay. It's it's after the new council is seated. So it 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 comes pretty quickly after the November election, early December ish, but it's one of those things that they hold off until the new council is seated. Makes sense. Any other future topics or I'll um, entertain a motion to adjourn? Hearing none, thank you to Tab and staff for all of your time. And as always to those members of the public joining us late into the night. Have a good night, everyone. See you guys soon.